Hello and uh, good afternoon at around 4 p.m. here in India, Indian Standard Time. Uh, this is Sashi Kumar speaking to you from Chennai in the south of India, where India's premier journalism college, the Asian College of Journalism, is situated. And I'm here in one of the studios of the college to discuss uh, with you online and to all our listeners and uh, our well-wishers who may be joining us on Facebook or other social media platform, the very crucial issue of uh, what is happening to our press, the challenges before the fourth estate, the freedom of speech, uh, on the occasion of the International Day uh, to end the impunity for crimes against journalists. That's the, uh, the occasion. Uh, we have a great lineup of uh, journalists, uh, media practitioners with us today, uh, ranging from starting with India, we'll be moving on to a neighborhood, to Sri Lanka, then on to London, uh, and then on to uh, neighboring uh, Nepal again. And then we move on to uh, uh, Kampala in Uganda. And then we'll be moving to Australia, and uh, from there across to Lebanon and Beirut, uh, and then all the way to California and the United States, and back closer home uh, in Bangladesh and Dhaka. So that's quite a, quite a global uh, kind of um, whistle-stop tour, if you like, that we'll be engaging in, but looking very seriously at the uh, issue of where journalism is at uh, as we uh, uh, we speak to you today, and uh, <clears throat> what are the issues that concern journalists and journalism here and now. As I speak to you in India, the breaking news this morning, in fact, uh, on the on the electronic and uh, uh, digital media, even yesterday, uh, was the this uh, revelation that Pegasus spyware uh, by an Israeli uh, cyber warfare or cyber cyber arms organization called NSO uh, had been used on WhatsApp um, platform uh, to scrutinize to intrude into uh, the communication uh, of uh, activists, uh, lawyers, uh, academics uh, who are critical of the government. And uh, this has uh, raised a big uproar here in India. And the government, uh, either preemptively or innocently, one doesn't know yet, uh, has in fact asked uh, WhatsApp for an explanation, wanting to know how it is that uh, Pegasus spyware was able to hack into WhatsApp and uh, get into uh, the communication process of uh, these activists and critics of the government. Uh, there are, of course, uh, uh, an entire spectrum of uh, uh, of uh, skeptics who think the government is being a bit too uh, over clever and by uh, raising this up front is trying to wash its hands uh, of the responsibility that the government may well be behind this move. Uh, what lends credence to this theory is also the fact that uh, the NSO, uh, which has this spy software, this Pegasus spyware, uh, normally, ha in fact, has declared that it only engages with government agencies, governments or their agencies. And uh, they charge quite a, a handsome amount for each of these uh, contracts, ranging, I mean, going into millions of dollars. And therefore, it's not likely that any individual or any uh, hacker, you know, any, or any um, loose cannon was behind this. It does look like a, a systematic orchestrated attempt. And uh, hopefully, in the days ahead, we'll get to the bottom of this. So this is to give you an indication of where we are at in India. And I'm sure the story is not too very different in a good part of the world, because we are in a situation where uh, liberal democracy is itself uh, under siege, uh, where in fact the idea of an illiberal democracy is, is, is gaining uh, credence in some parts of the world, uh, where uh, in places like Turkey or Poland or Hungary um, or uh, in Philippines uh, or in India or even in the United States, we can see that the uh, liberal democracy is on the back foot and therefore the fourth estate, media, which is a free media, which is a sin qua non of uh, true democracy, is also uh, on the back foot. And that's the context in which we're having this conversation. Uh, we'll try and go across now to our first uh, uh, guest, uh, who is a very familiar figure, not just in India, but in uh, several parts of the world, because he's one of the pioneers of uh, the independence of journalism, of uh, reliable, rigorous journalism, an investigative journalist par excellence himself. Uh, he was the uh, 
former editor-in-chief of the Hindu group of newspapers. Uh, currently, he's a publisher and also the chairman of uh, Kasturi and Sons, which, which runs the Hindu group of newspapers. That's Mr. N. Ram, and he joins us now uh, from not just in Chennai, but somewhere else in Tamil Nadu. Thank you, Ram, for joining this conversation, this global conversation, and nice to have you back. I was uh, just mentioning the context in which we are having this conversation, uh, the concerns that uh, the challenges that uh, free media, freedom of the press, journalism faces today. Uh, I, you have, of course, given this uh, a lot of thought. You have written about it. You have spoken about it in various fora. Uh, can I ask you in the next few minutes to give us your uh, sense of where we are at and uh, what are the big issues facing freedom of the media, particularly freedom of the fourth estate, and uh, what do you see the road ahead uh, is like? What does the road ahead look like to you? Uh, Sashi, uh, thank you for uh, this invitation and this opportunity to discuss issues of great uh, import, uh, very urgent issues. Uh, I start by noting that uh, there's, a, there's a huge literature today, research, uh, report, uh, official reports, as well as uh, by others, independent uh, researchers. And the consensus from this literature is that uh, freedom of the media, news media, and independence of news media, they have declined, are in a process of decline, not just in so-called countries with authoritarian rulers or governments, but practically across the world, much of the world. And that certainly includes India. In fact, uh, uh, India ranks, according to last report by the uh, by Reporters Without Borders, India ranked very low, 138 from the bottom out of 180 countries and territories. And Sashi, you know that we used to, you and I used to think yeah. several decades ago that uh, we were in an enviable position. Today, uh, for me, it was about 40 years ago when, uh, you know, after the authoritarian emergency, the, the press emerged uh, liberated, energized, independent, and uh, on, on a path of growth. But today, if we are to claim that India is in an enviable position, you'll be accused of purveying fake news or disinformation. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but today is an important day because uh, uh, it's, uh, it's the, the designated by the United Nations uh, as the day to end impunity day to for crime against journalists, yes. UN, uh, December 2013, the UN General Assembly established this day. And since then, there has been some progress in raising awareness and, uh, you know, UN plan of action, uh, UNESCO Director General reports every year on, on this. But uh, the situation is no better despite the increase in awareness. I just want to. Uh, uh, cite some figures here. Um, you know, the Committee to Protect Journalists, I think this is this has done the most uh, systematic work uh, uh, on uh, keeping murders of journalists. Mm -hmm. That is murders that took place uh, in connection with uh, uh, when journalists are engaged in their in own work, not in some private dispute. And the figures are quite shocking. Uh, the CPJ, after careful inquiry and strict verification, has documented uh, uh, the work-related killing of mm -hmm. 1,354 journalists worldwide, including 50 in India since 1992. The CPJ, remember, began tracking this from uh, 2008. Yes. Uh, they track it from the year 1992. And uh, if you look at India, of the 50 killed in India since 1992, Yes. 35 were murdered in retribution for or to prevent news coverage or commentary. And the remaining yes. 50 lost their lives in dangerous assignments or in ceasefire or, or in crossfire. Right. Uh, what we know from this is those, the most vulnerable are those who uh, cover politics, corruption, crime, human rights yeah. violations. Yeah. And most of the time it's, uh, you know, rep local reporters, in working for small time newspapers or media, but more recently, even major editors like uh, uh, Gauri Lankesh yes. uh, and, uh, 
and so on have been murdered, targeted and murdered brazenly. But what makes it worse is the climate of impunity that uh, that exists. And India, unfortunately, is one of the 12 countries uh, uh, which are, uh, you, you know, where uh, I- impunity, impunity yes. for the killers operates. Yes. yes. Uh, clearly, there's not a single case has been resolved, brought to a resolution yes. uh, on these murders. So we are, in fact, we can claim to be a founding and permanent member of this club of shame. And uh, when the UNESCO organized Director General writes to governments, Mm-hmm. asking for the uh, status of these cases, the judicial process. India is one of the... It does not report, does not respond at all. No response mm-hmm. from India at all. So they don't even right. recognize the UN, UN sanctioned process of monitoring the yes. uh, whether impunity is at work or it's, it's getting better and so on. Yes. So it's a very serious situation. Yes, Ram, you have actually, yes, you have, I think, uh, pointed to how grim the situation is. If I might just uh, point the finger at uh, something you set out by saying, uh, you said this is not just peculiar to authoritarian regimes. There seems to be across the world a situation where journalism uh, is in a state of siege. Uh, do you think there is a, this is the beginning of what one might call an existential crisis for, uh, for the avocation of journalism itself? Is it is it technologically determined? Is it that journalism has or is becoming superfluous? Is there a disconnect between the public and journalism? Do you have a hunch that we may have those of us who have been journalists for so long may have been taking it for granted? Maybe journalism has lived its day. Yes, this uh, it is as you said this existential challenge, if not crisis, yeah. it, it, very complex. It's very complicated. Many things have gone into it. One is what is happening to journalism itself within its values, the independence. Uh, You see it in the United States where they have the First Amendment uh, being battered day in and day out by President Trump and various others. In India, we, you know, serious journalists are called prostitutes and so on. But Mm -hmm. there is a business crisis as well, which makes, uh, which makes people more reluctant to uphold the values that uh, we were brought up on as journalists investigative journalists. Still, there are spaces where it goes on. There are brave mm-hmm. journalists. There are news organizations which swim against the current, but yeah. suddenly it is uphill. Uh, I think journalism, uh, you know, it, 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 it's an open question, I think. Uh, we can't give the pious answer that because people want information and because people want to appreciate credible information and independent, uh, independent journalism, uh, there will be a market for it and so on. No such guarantee. The business model is absolutely vital here. And today with Google surveillance, you started out with that. Uh, What's happened, Pegasus, but it's not just Pegasus. I think the whole threat of digital surveillance and Jamal Khashoggi's murder. Sure. uh, The reporter that has linked it with a message with uh, with Pegasus breaking into the phone of another Saudi activist, uh, dissident who was based in Montreal, and it has been proved by Citizen Lab, uh, mm-hmm. the University of Toronto. Uh, so I think the threat is big. And the point is, yes, it's very complex. It's not just authoritarian government censorship, attacks and violence. It's what is happening internally. Technology yeah. has a lot to do with it. But uh, often you are helpless. And these uh, so-called technology companies, uh, mm-hmm. which are a law to themselves, Facebook, WhatsApp, Google, yes. Yes. On. I think uh, there are real problems here. Uh, they, they have, they've done a lot. There are things to appreciate in what they do, but yes. uh, they are utterly beyond the reach of law. Uh, right. They pay their fines and move on. And I think uh, their business model is at the heart of uh, the present uh, existential crisis of the news media and journalism, Sashi. I think we have a, a question for you, for, uh, Ram, from someone in Bangalore, uh, Mr. Arindam Bose. I, he's, 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 he's coming on with a question. Uh, meanwhile, I saw another uh, respondent saying, why are we, ha- why, why are we having this conversation uh, after four and a half years? I don't know why she meant that, but, but obviously this is a conversation she thinks should have taken place even earlier. I might mention here that uh, at the ACJ, we've been having these periodic global conversations on the same subject. Yes, Arindam, you're, yes, you're online. Go ahead. Uh, you have Ram with you. Go ahead with your question. Uh, 
good evening sir can you able to hear me hello hello i can hear you clearly yes sir i am from karnataka bangalore so my question is very simple mr gauri lankesh the great uh, journalist and the uh, social worker who has been killed and murdered in front of your house how it will affect the journalism whether the purity of journalism will be there and after the people will be scared or what will be the effect on that yes you given the answer to that it has a chilling effect it intimidates others so so people will think many of them sitting on the fence why go so far shujat mukari is another he was killed yeah. uh, you know the brazen murder and many small town reporters belonging to a number of newspapers and tv channels and some so just uh, sorry for the benefit of our foreign listeners of us was a ace journalist operating out of uh, jammu and kashmir which is going through a a process of uh, reconfiguration sure. of its very status as we speak yes yes go ahead sorry yeah you are absolutely right uh, it sends a message and that's the whole purpose is that one is to knock out the particular journalist but the larger purpose is to send out a message that uh, don't do this don't repeat it so that is often called the chilling effect or sometimes they'll say a creeping quiet uh, across journalism across you know you, you may be diverse you may have had a good track record in the past but now people will think twice especially as the jobs are in danger there's no there's no security of tenure as there used to be years ago Uh, all the time there are you know there's a uh, pe- people are losing their jobs there there's not enough recruitment although we have a, we are happy to see that acj uh, students graduates uh, do get recruited year after year and we're talking about 150 180 200 people every year uh, so there are opportunities but uh, and we hope our those whom we educate are armed with these values but when they go to the newsroom are they able to uphold these values uh, that's the big question but you are it's a good question uh, thank you Ar- arindam thank you thank you arindam bose and uh, uh, i think we'll have to leave this there uh, thank you ram as we move on to our next guest thank you very much for being with us for taking time off uh, to flag some of those very serious issues which you did uh, on, on the front of technology of people of the whole uh, business of journalism the the model the paradigm itself Uh, thank you very much for those very valuable opening comments on our program uh, that was uh, n ram uh, with us uh, speaking about the issues that journalism face today the, the the crucial issues that journalism face today and uh, he he touched on this issue of uh, the, uh, 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 the, the 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 statistics of journalists killed in india over the years since 1992 i think we have we may have a graph coming up on that to just uh, drive home this point to to emphasize underline this point uh, you know the, the the number of journalists who have been killed the number of journalists who have been imprisoned um, it, it, it's a it's a sorry tale and uh, if you look at the overall picture india fares very poorly uh, on this front uh, from 1993 uh there there's there's a statistic coming up in 93 two journalists killed one imprisoned in 94 two journalists killed again in 95 one imprisoned one killed in uh, 97 there's been a sudden leap a kind of sudden uh, you know spurt in the graph and seven journalists have been killed and uh, in 2001 to 2003 you'll find single digits again every year one 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 journalist killed one journalist killed one of them of course uh, imprisoned in that phase and then you come to 2005 uh, between 5 and 7 one journalist killed another spike between 2007 and 9 you'll find four journalists suddenly being ki- uh, killed 2009 there's one journalist killed and one imprisoned uh, in 2011 and then you find a big shift in the graph you'll find more and more of journalists being uh, attacked uh, you find the number of deaths increasing the number of imprisonments increasing from 2011 Uh, two killed and two imprisoned uh, two killed and five uh, imprisoned uh, four killed and one imprisoned these are the, these are the figures that come in 2015 we have one journalist killed and four imprisoned in 2017 you have four journalists killed and two imprisoned up until 2017 18 you have five journalists killed and one imprisoned and so it's a it's a story that is getting worse and worse and it's it's likely from what we can see to get even worse uh before it if at all it does get better so that's that's the sorry state of affairs as far as 
uh, the, the the journalists are concerned and uh, what's been happening to them uh, in, in India. And the story, I think, is uh, is as as bad in many other parts of the world, uh, in, in places like uh, you know, in, in other parts of Asia, in other parts of Africa and Middle East, and so on. Uh, and uh, even in America, as you find the threat to journalists, the physical threats to journalists, uh, the intimidation, and and the toll that it takes. Uh, these are uh, some of the big big issues that 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 uh, we are we are being faced with. Uh, we. We we were supposed to be joined by um, Suhasini Haider from Delhi, but I think we're having some problems connecting to her, and uh, so we will try and uh, move on um, uh, if if we can now to uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, um, or in fact, someone from Sri Lanka, but who is joining us from Melbourne, and we are trying to connect to her, Amanta Pereira, uh, who hopefully will have will have her with us uh, in, in a short while. Uh, but uh, uh, so. Just to uh, recapitulate some of the points that Ram made while while our producers are trying to get uh, a month on the line, uh, journalism, the game of journalism has changed. It's it's not uh, the game that we knew. It's not the uh, profession, the avocation that we took for granted. Uh, it, it, it 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 certainly has its public spiritedness. It has uh, some of the important characteristics that uh, define uh, the profession, but it's changed and. Is there a paradigm shift? Let, let, let me take this question to our guest who is joining us, Amanta Pereira. Uh, Amanta Pereira, uh, let me, uh, we have him online. Uh, let me very quickly introduce him. Hello, Amanta. This is Sashi Hi. Kumar from Chennai. Hi, and Sashi. Uh, 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 very nice of you to join us. Uh, I think it, it must be about midnight or so there, or I mean, close to 10 o'clock in uh, Melbourne, yeah. where you are now, about 10 o'clock. Yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's close uh, to 10 o'clock. Yeah. Amanta happens to be in Melbourne now, so he's joining us from there. But he's actually foreign correspondent based in Colombo, uh, and he's uh, also the Asia Pacific coordinator of the DART Center of Journalism and Trauma. It's a project of the Columbia Journalism School in New York, and he contributes to a range of international publications, including Time, Guardian, Reuters, The Washington Post, and his uh, focus areas include conflict, conflict situations, human disasters, and climate change. Uh, I might mention here that he's also the winner of the 2012 Prince Albert UN Global Prize for Climate Change Reporting. Let me uh, kick this off with you, Amanta, by asking you, today we, when we speak about climate change, we speak about a paradigm shift, and there's a sense of urgency about climate change. Is there an accompanying urgency about, about journalism, about freedom of expression of the press? Is there a paradigm shift, uh, not just in terms of the revenue model, but in terms of uh, the relevance of journalism, uh, the importance, the role it plays in society, uh, is what we assume journalism was for several decades or perhaps for centuries, uh, suddenly being um, uh, uh, upended by by digital technology, by journalism segueing into the social media, if you like, and a whole host of other empirical facts that we observe in, in our time. Uh, perhaps you could address this issue. Yeah, I think you're quite right. I mean, there is a paradigm shift taking place right now. And I take off from where Ram left. Uh, journalism uh, needs to figure out what relevance we have in the world that we live in today. And if you, if you take, for an example, Sri Lanka, uh, five years ago, uh, we thought that Sri Lanka was at a watershed and mm -hmm. there was press freedom that coming in from a very repressive media regime, we were going into a, a regime where it was going to be freer, media could express more freely. Well, obviously there was freedom given, there were, the media became freer. But as Sri Lanka uh, is just two weeks away from another watershed election, we need to take a step back and look at whether what these freedoms or the environment of to report freely whether it has allowed us to become more trustworthy uh, we, in our audiences. Yeah. And journalism is facing existential threats. Number one, we have lost trust uh, in our audiences. And why is that? Uh, mm. Is it because of partisan reporting? Is it because that we always give the mic to those who have power? Uh, mm. Or is it because of other reasons? And then there's also this other issue of we have also 
lost the exclusivity that we had because today you don't need a media outlet, a newspaper or a TV station or radio station to be a journalist. If you look at Sri Lanka right now, most of the news, most of the information on the ongoing presidential campaign is actually coming from uh, ordinary citizens who are just out there on the streets and who happen to see these things taking place. So as journalists, we need to look at what our relevance is right now. And if I may add, I think that relevance right now is authenticity. Because mm-hmm. if we go out there and if we carry a badge and if you say, we, I am a journalist, my job is information, my job is giving out information and verified authentic information. And in this climate of fake news, deep fake, misinformation, disinformation, I think journalism has the role to show this is the valid information. And and again, I go back to Sri Lanka. Uh, two days ago, the voting for the presidential election started and the postal voting. And then there are posts on various social media platforms in fact, uh, commenting about the percentage of the postal vote, which is a blatant lie. The postal votes are kept locked till uh, the voting is finished and then only counted. But th- those uh, posts are spreading uh, and they're becoming viral. And as journalists, our job is to go out there and say, this is not the truth. This is what is not what's happening. So I think right now, as far as I can see, uh, the change that we need to build is to build trust and to build authenticity in our audiences. Right, Amanda, there are some very important points there. In fact, even in India, uh, we have envied Sri Lanka, for instance, at a time when, because you have decriminalized defamation, for instance, in Sri Lanka. In India, you know, defamation is still a criminal offense. In Sri Lanka, I think you got rid of that from your statute books, an old colonial uh, kind of act. Uh, and yet, Sri Lanka also has, the, the, I think the journalism has had a roller coaster ride, if I might call it that. It's ups and downs, very stark ups yeah. and downs. But after the war, after the, um, uh, you know, the a war, um, a war and so on. Uh, do you think journalism was coming into its own, was finding its own identity, uh, its critical identity? Would you say that journalism in Sri Lanka, by and large, uh, tends to be critical and uh, objective and independent? In India, I'm afraid we can't say that anymore about the majority of our journalism, unfortunately. Uh, how would you how would you look at the situation in Sri Lanka, particularly, of course, in the context of elections when uh, when when tempers are frayed and uh, the journalists tend to be that much more vulnerable? Well, I think in Sri Lanka, there are independent journalists. There are colleagues of mine who are spread out in that island who are trying their level best to be independent, to trying to report as best as they can and to the best of their abilities. So there are journalists who are trying to be independent and trying to be professional. If you take our media organizations, I don't think they're independent. I think each media organization has a bias. Some of them are blatant. Some of them are subtle. And when I say blatant, if you look at the TV stations, the electronic media, they're blatant. You you just can't miss their biases. And when it comes to the print media, sometimes the, the biases are much more subtle. Uh, and I think uh, given what Sri Lanka has suffered as a country and the media community has suffered as a community, we've had ample opportunities to build up and become much more professional. And unfortunately, we haven't. If you look at the last five years, last four years, when uh, in 2015, when this uh, environment of free expression came about, there was this chance for us to build as a media, uh, mm. build as journalists, to become much more professional, to go out there and say, look, we stand with our audiences. It is we have a duty and we will stand by our duty. What has happened is the media has polarized and it hasn't polarized on ideologies. It hasn't polarized on ideas. It has actually polarized on political parties. And, and it has gone to the level of being polarized on politicians. So what now we have is an out and out cat fight where one media organization is screaming over the other media organization to promote 
a, a agenda or a certain line of a political party or a certain politician. And it's unfortunate that given the country's talent, given the commitment of journalists, that we haven't been able to achieve this. Right. So uh, in the Sri Lankan context, uh, political parties or media organizations have become cat's paws of political parties and therefore they reflect their propaganda arms of, of different political parties. Uh, I, I think in India we can see the same kind of situation. Uh, is there also identity politics being played out in the media in terms of say uh, ethnic uh, strife or ethnic fragmentation? Does the media uh, become part of the problem rather than you know instead of putting out the flames does it actually fuel the flame? Uh, we see uh, some of that happening in India as well. Uh, would, you, would, would Sri Lanka be in a similar plight or are you different? No, I think again, my answer would be similar to what I gave for the last uh, question, where there are individual journalists who are mm -hmm. trying to be unbiased, who are trying not to inflame already tense, already frayed uh, uh, nerves. But if you look at but they are, media, they are the minority, they would be the exception to the rule or are they are they substantial enough to make a difference? I think they are minority, but much more than that, I think their voices are drowned out because right. we have these large media organizations which hold the bullhorn and which have the largest voices or the largest penetration into the country, which are not only playing partisan politics, they're mm -hmm. actually inflaming uh already tense uh, uh nerves and already uh, already tense situation by not only be, being reporting partially and selectively but sometimes reporting out and out lies and yes. and and the unfortunate situation is we as a country have suffered in the last 50 years sri lanka such a small country such a beautiful country we suffered tremendously there was a war that virtually decimated this country. Our youth uh, were, were, didn't have a chance to fulfill whatever their dreams were. And we were able to come out of that situation. It's unfortunate that as a community, the media hasn't recognized this and tried to build bridges. In fact, what they're doing right now is burning bridges wherever they can. Right. Yes, so that, 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 that is actually a problem. The other trend that we see, perhaps in other parts of the world as well, but in India, one can certainly see this, the growing disconnect between the public and the media, the growing criti criticism or shall we say cynical attitude to the media by the public. Now, the media is supposed to represent to the public what is happening around them. And if the public is not willing to accept what the media says or takes it with a bag full of salt, there's a huge problem, isn't it? As Ram was yeah. mentioning, as I was talking yeah. with Ram, an existential crisis. If journalism is on the one hand adversarial to the state, and on the other hand finds itself an adversary of the public, what is the raison d'etre, as it yeah. were, of journalism itself? Yeah, yeah I think in Sri Lanka, I think uh, traditionally we've had this public cynicism uh, on the media, and now it has turned into public distrust uh, mm -hmm. because the public has always been and rightfully uh, not so trustful about the media, knowing that they are certain power brokers, that they, are, they, that they either support a certain political party or a certain agenda. And the issue in Sri Lanka has always been that newspapers, television, electronic media organizations have not been upfront about these biases. The only bias that you would know clearly is the government bias. And you know the government media institution will will be on, on, on the side of the government. Yes. Uh, now, the issue that we face is into this myth, into an already cynical public, we mm. uh, now comes social media. And yes. then uh, this kind of situation where the, the public is looking for authentic information is fertile ground for fake news because they now look for other avenues and everybody who is pretending to be a media organization or someone who has information, even information on a particular incident or a particular person now becomes a, a authentic or a, a public information channel. And there is this huge uh, threat of fake news just spreading through Sri Lanka. And I would just finally add and into this, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. 
social media companies big companies like facebook aren't doing anything at all they just come out and uh, do public awareness campaigns but uh, in terms of the scale of the problem that we are having right now they are not diverting the resources that are needed to at least keep a handle on this issue yes and the problem is compounded because uh, uh, platforms like facebook that you mentioned uh, when uh, they they pretend to be technology platforms but they're actually media platforms and uh, uh, so it, it, it very it's very difficult to actually fix the blame on them uh, but i think that, that this is increasingly becoming quite quite potent and quite patent that uh, social media platforms of that humongous uh, size and influence uh, have a big role to play a big responsibility to fulfill in contexts such as these uh, we have someone standing by uh, amantha uh, to ask you a question uh, that is abhinaya kannan and uh, she, she she abhinaya if you if you are with us now you can uh, raise your question uh, for uh, uh, amantha pereira uh, she Hi, should sir. be joining uh, joining us very soon now um, uh, uh, there, there we are hello hello abhinaya yes uh, we have uh, uh, amantha pereira with us go ahead and and, and make your point yeah. so you spoke about how a lot of voices are being drowned out in sri lanka right now so what do you think is the status of uh, sri, uh, sri lankan tamil journalists are they under even more danger uh comparatively if you go back to what was happening 10 years back or even further back i think the safety has increased but again the same issues that we see at a national level where the media is becoming polarized and controlled by either business and political interests linked into the businesses have taken over so during the 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 conflict one of the things that we saw with the tamil media was that at least there were voices there were platforms which spoke about the the civilians who were caught in in between this conflict these innocent civilians who had no choice right but now what we see is that most of the reporting is just about those who hold power either political power business power or even popularity so in that way uh, in terms of physical threats they may have gone down but in terms of a media that is more representative of their community i think they're doing a bad job thank you so much sir yeah, you're welcome right so uh, 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 thank you amantha that that, that... <laughs> Oh, there's there's one more question uh, coming for you from the from from among our uh, those who are following us on Facebook, and I think uh, we'll just have the question up for you in a minute, uh, in in a few seconds. Or, sorry, uh, I've just got a flag that there's someone someone wanting to ask you something. Yes, there we are, Mary Elizabeth Mueller, uh, who is a, a German national. Who, in fact, yeah. we know her because she passes by Chennai once in a while. if part of the solution is that journalistic journalists strengthen their conversational relationships with their users as amantha says what could measure this and how could it be translated in terms of real impact in politics did you get the question uh, yeah 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 well i think that that's that's a really tricky question because we are not only talking about uh, the the ideological issues we are also look, talking about the tech that is that is involved and i think we need to build uh, certain models that allow us number one to have valid conversations right now most of the conversation is just pure uh, noise uh, as most of the conversations that are happening on these digital platforms uh, how do we have valid conversations and then how do we measure the validity of those conversation in terms of real life impact and that's a larger question that we need to uh, we need to uh, address i think the beginning would be how do we first of all uh, build trust and then in terms of this question how do we start having valid conversations with our audiences uh, instead of like this back and forth uh, about Uh, uh, abuse and racism and and that's what's happening on social media right now if you look at what's happening on sri lanka most of the reactions that journalists are getting is out and out abuse and then it becomes a screaming match and we need to move beyond that and i think the first hurdle is that 
Thank you. Thank you, Amanta, for that. And thank you, Marie Elizabeth Mueller, for the question. Thank you very much, um, um, Amanta. I think we'll now let you go to sleep in <laughs> Melbourne, where you are, and uh, enjoy the rest of your stay there. Thank you very much. Uh, so that was uh, Amanta Pereira, uh, who is a Sri Lankan journalist, but he was speaking to us from Melbourne in Australia. Uh, we now will move on to Nepal in, 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 just, a, in just a few seconds or minutes. Uh, but the very important issues flagged by, by Amanta, and some of that uh, have strong resonances here in India as well. Uh, the problem of uh, identities in a plural society, uh, the, how media plays into othering certain identities. We have seen that in India. And uh, perhaps uh, other South Asian contexts share a, a similar situation. We have... Uh, uh, Namrata Sharma with us. Hello, uh, Namrata ji. Good, uh, good afternoon. Nice to see you. Hello, Shashi ji. How are you? Good afternoon. Very, Namaskar. Very well. Very well. Thank you. Let me quickly introduce uh, Namrata. Uh, she's a journalist and an activist, in fact, from Nepal with uh, about two decades of work experience in uh, women's empowerment and uh, print journalism in Nepal, as well as in Kenya, where she worked, uh, UK, India and Afghanistan. Uh, she's the editor of a woman empowerment magazine called Nadi Swar, which means women's voice, and the former president of the Center for Investigative Journalism in Nepal. So we have the appropriate person in, in Nepal. Nepal has had a fairly uh, uh, vibrant press, uh, particularly radio journalism. I think we, are, we envy the kind of radio journalism Nepal has, because in India, it's a very, very apology of a, a radio journalism that we have, because the government doesn't allow news on, uh, uh, on, on private uh, radio stations. Namrata ji, we are looking at the state of uh, the freedoms in, 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 in the media, as you know. Uh, how would you uh, look at it from the perspective of uh, Nepal today? Uh, are things better than they were before? And what are the big concerns or the big issues that you face in, in Nepal or from the perspective from Kathmandu? Yeah. Shashi ji, actually, you very rightly said Nepal has a very vibrant media and particularly radio you're right and it has actually been able to reach uh, depths in the mountains and himal and tarai everywhere and so that's our strength and to tell you the truth as you know we have uh, had uh, freedom of press only since 1990 after the restoration of democracy in nepal and uh, since then and now i would say that Nepal's media house has come a long way. However, just to come to today, it will not be a exaggeration to say that the journalism sector in Nepal and journalists in particular are in a pretty precarious and challenging position. You know, it's very interesting. And, and you from a neighboring country, I'm sure have observed that uh, media has played a very, very important role. Uh, in restorating democracy then throughout the civil movement and to the fact uh, that Nepal is now a republic, federal republic state from absolute monarchy before 1990. Uh, media has actually played a very role even before 1990, underground, bringing out, you know, news, corruption and staging a kind of... Um, awareness against the panchayat system, absolute monarchy. Yeah. But actually, if you come now, uh, what has happened is now that it seems we have achieved our goal of having a completely democracy established in the country with federal state, uh, what's happening, the government is kind of trying to control the media, you see, mm. in the name of uh, privacy. Mm. What's happened is right to privacy is coming. And of course, as human rights activists, we all support that there has to be right to privacy. However, when there are issues related to public interest, there's nothing called right to privacy. And as you probably know, Nepal also has a right to information act. Mm -hmm. However, now that the federal state and provinces have been set up, the federal and provincial government have started making their rules and regulations. It's still a bit hazy. However, in that process, what has been observed that there have been many a times where um, journalists have not been given information as per their right to information and access to information. Mm -hmm. So that raises a question 
on what is going to happen you know as federalism takes roots in the country free press is a very important has a very important role to play you know one thing i want to bring over here is um nepal doesn't have the kind of strength that our neighboring countries like you sri lanka faces where death and killing of journalists happens very often however having said that what i want to say is during the civil movement the there were several journalists who were who have been disappeared and who have been killed but there is no information as to where they are and what happened even till now and after in the democratization process as you know you know there have been commissions set up to find for disappeared people for you know like uh, truth and reconciliation however yeah. none of these uh, commissions have given any information or clue regarding to what has happened to those journalists who were killed and who disappeared during the civil movement so that you know like kind of makes us question both the human rights sector in nepal and journalism as to the intent you know in in the beginning all the leaders we have now who are sitting in the leader positions were fighting against the autocratic system but now slowly what we are seeing is that autocracy is coming back and one thing other i want to bring to the notice here globally is you know since 1990 and now nepal actually has a very robust private sector coming up too right but there is you know like it's a very interesting fact that there is a cartel system and you know uh, the private sector is kind of protected in various corruption by the political parties mm -hmm. now who breaks these nexus it's the journalist you see and so now if you come into the state of impunity in the country uh, well um, what has happened is after the federal system has come uh the the old civil codes have changed mulki ai you know so the new civil codes and criminal civil criminal laws have come in uh, effect in nepal but in these new laws there are certain rules and regulations in the name of the sovereignty and right to information they have tried to anchor journalists from bringing out uh, information related to public interest right and yeah and um, if you want to cut me you can do that or no, no, uh, so you're saying that journalists find it more and more difficult to uh, talk about things that ought to be in the public interest there there, there are uh, it's they, difficult they, but uh, it's difficult but we have been doing it right. and there have been rules and regulations brought to curb right. the um, rights of journalists to get information right. but on the uh, so the, and and they have also put in you know like fining uh imprisonment so it, you know it's difficult for journalists in very remote rural part of nepal to go and try to get information from the local authorities and when right. the local authorities start threatening them what do they right. do you see yeah. but having said that if you look at 2018 and 2019 i'd like to share the uh i'd like to share the fact that even cij nepal uh yeah. the nepal leaks you see so we exposed 55 billion us dollars being stacked into um uh in in swiss bank and uh, right. other right. countries but if you come to action being taken against there's no action being taken you see okay. so that way it's the state of impunity is very much prevalent in in nepal and it's it's very difficult for journalists to get out information and also private sector uh, the the media has been corporatized now you see yes. so it's yes. not only the state it's also the private sector uh, interests that are there which puts more difficulties for editors to bring out the news right so uh, from what you say uh, namrata there are one or two follow up questions that come to my mind one uh, in the federal structure in nepal 
uh, where there's already a tension in terms of the federal situation. Uh, right. Which is the more influential press? Is it is it the regional language press, the local native language press, or is, or is it the English press, which may be concentrated in Kathmandu? Uh, is, is there a sense of power relations between the two? You could probably give us a quick uh, idea about that. And and secondly, I think you hinted at the growth of monopoly press of uh, corporate press in 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 Nepal, like like indeed in other parts of the world. And um, right. how how this corporate crony capitalism and the alliance between the the state and the press and this kind of press actually cuts out the public interest and puts the man on the street uh, out on the fringes. Uh, is, is that is that the way it's going? Um, well, let me say let me let me start with the language issue. Yeah. As uh, as the provincial uh, government are now setting up their systems. Uh, you know, like the, the most powerful uh, language that the media uses in Nepal is mm -hmm. Nepali. So right. Nepali is the language that is spoken across the country. And mm -hmm. then, of course, there is the media, English media also. And as you say, as you rightly hint or say, is that in the urban area, Indian press, uh, sorry, mm -hmm. English, English uh, yeah. language has a dominant role over policymakers, the elite sector, schools, university, colleges, and all that. So that does have a role. But however, Nepali language is the cross-cutting. Now, coming to the other, you know, Nepal has a lot of ethnic communities, and it's a huge, diverse country. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of languages that have not been developed in such a way that, you know, like you have strong media um, raising the voices of those communities but it's starting slowly it's starting mm -hmm. but uh, but one thing is very powerful is the community radio and the overall radio system yeah. and that actually is in nepali it, the there is english also but um, uh, nepali is um, uh, the language that's uh, widely spoken Right. Uh, there's a so, question from someone, uh, Abhinaya Kandan wants to know, what is the status of the proposed media bill in Nepal? Yeah, I'm glad, um, Abhinaya, that you asked that question, because that's a very important um, um, issue in Nepal at the mm -hmm. moment. Uh, they have, uh, if, had the bill been passed as it was, we all the journalists would probably have to not been able to do what we are doing now, right? Mm -hmm. So they were trying, as I said earlier, when I was talking, that is precisely what the bill was trying to do is in the name of right to privacy, cut off the journalists in uh, getting information uh, through the right to information and otherwise also. But there were the Federation of Nepal Journalists uh, launched a movement against this, and we all joined hands. So the bill has not been passed. Mm -hmm. And um, the stance there saying, uh, like journalism getting right to information, particularly of public interest, has been intact at, at the moment, you see. Um, and, and to tell you the truth, I'll just share uh, with you one uh, incident. After the Nepal leaks uh, happened, the editor of CIJ was actually a um, uh, defamation uh, case was filed against him in the court. Mm -hmm. But the Supreme Court favored uh, in, the, uh, in our interest, in CIJ interest and in the uh, interest of the editor. So those mm -hmm. things are there. However, having said that, although the bill hasn't been passed the way it intended to pass you know what it reflects is that uh, the intention of the government is there to curtail and after that bill there, there's another development that i want to share is the press council uh, has also been of interest to the government you know and they want to now put government officers as office bearers of press council but again there was a and there was a movement against this by the journalists and human rights activists, and this has not gone through. So that is one thing in Nepal is that I think throughout this whole movement of um, anti-monarchism and then the civil movement, uh, there is an effort by human rights activists, by journalists to come out in the street to stop the government from bringing out wrong laws and regular acts, you see. However, having said that, 
again, even in the constitution and even in the bill, there is a, you know, like broad this thing saying that for the sovereignty of the country and for the rights, privacy, according to the rights to privacy, you actually can curb somebody if you want to. And that right. puts fear right. in the people. Right. So it has a kind of chilling effect in terms of yes. free functioning. Yes, and a couple of and quite a few journalists have been put in prison because of that, and particularly in the provincial state where they go to get information from the wards, they have actually been threatened. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, uh, very recently, there are two singers actually, mm -hmm. one who uh, had a lyric, uh, you know, question uh, showing the corruption in the country, right. and the, uh, was actually asked to take out his song from the tube uh, and also put in prison and then very recently a rapper was also arrested right so these threats are from political parties or their henchmen are they are they street uh, uh, you know is it is it a is it a threat from the street or is it is it a threat from the establishment establishment from the establishment all right yes. okay that's very 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 significant because in india we also have a combination of both there's both the uh, the, the threat from the street and also from uh, 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 from from the establishment uh, thank you very much uh, indeed namrata uh, for being with us and giving us these very useful insights into what's happening in nepal in fact uh, i read recently that nepal is doing better than india in terms of its economic performance and so uh, somebody is getting a lot of things right there i mean before uh -huh. it. so thank you very much and i look forward to more such conversations with you uh, thank you for joining us for now Thank you. Thank so that you. was uh, Namrata Sharma from uh, Nepal. And uh, we will now move on, uh, hopefully, to the United Kingdom, where a veteran journalist, uh, broadcaster, um, Andrew Whitehead, uh, will be joining us. Uh, uh, and, uh, 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 well, uh, while we wait for him, I might as well tell you that uh, Kolisi has lifted the World Cup after South Africa crushed England. Uh, so that, that, that's, that's by way of breaking news. Andrew, hi, welcome, Andrew. And uh, have you heard that Colisi lifted the World Cup uh, after South Africa crushed England? Uh, are, are you looking downcast because of that, or am I imagining things? <laughs> I saw, <laughs> hi, Sashi. I saw hi. most of the game, and yes. uh, I saw by the time South Africa had scored their second try, I mean, to be honest, the game was up. But I have sure. to say, football is my sport, and I sure. have visions that one day in my life I'll see England win the World Cup again. Right. Great, Andrew. But let me introduce Andrew fully to our other um, uh, followers uh, who are with us on this program. Uh, Andrew has over three decades, uh, three and a half decades, in fact, of experience as a BBC correspondent and uh, presenter. He was also editor of the BBC World Service News. Uh, he's a historian, a lecturer, freelance journalist, uh, honorary professor at the University of Nottingham. He teaches American undergraduates in London for global education, Oregon. And very significantly, he's a visiting professor at the Asian College of Journalism in Chennai. Uh, he's authored, uh, this book was out recently. It's a wonderful book, The Lives of Frida, uh, Frida a biography of Frida Bedi, who was the first Western woman to take ordination in Tibetan Buddhism. And the other book is A Mission to Kashmir, uh, the earlier book, an account of the origins of the Kashmir conflict. So that's Andrew White. And thank you for joining us uh, on this uh, global conference. Uh, you know, the issue we are discussing, of course, is something that's very close to our hearts, something of great concern to all of us, uh, that of uh, uh, press freedom. And uh, particularly today when we are commemorating uh, or flagging the issue of uh, uh, denying any impunity for those who attack journalists. A uh, number of journalists have died in various parts of the world. In India, the numbers seem to be going up over the last decade. Uh, and overall, journalism seems to be in a state of siege in the best parts of the world and on the back foot and, uh, I mean, uh, perhaps a retreat in, in many other parts of the world. Andrew, we, in, as we speak to you, uh, I think it's unique that in England we have a journalist who is also the prime minister now. And uh, we, uh, we have, a, I mean, he's a, he's a, he's a very uh, uh, interesting person. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, someone who occupies a lot of mind space across the world today. Uh, how do you see journalism, uh, uh, you know, uh, evolving in, in the West? 
Uh, in England, I don't know if there are particular concerns in terms of the credibility or crisis to journalism, threats to journalism. Uh, I, I do, do give us your thoughts on uh, this. I'm sure you've been thinking about this off and on. Well, you mentioned our prime minister, who is uh, who was a journalist, has been a columnist until very recently. Um, yes. It's also worth mentioning he was sacked uh, by the Times newspaper for inventing a quote early in his career. So his record as a journalist is not without blemish. Um, but that's uh, a track record, of... interesting track record. If you need to be sacked to become the prime minister, it's, it's well worth <laughs> losing the job. Anyway, sorry. Well, yeah, there's, there's a, a lot to be said there, but that might take us off in a, in a different <laughs> sure, direction. Sure, sure. Carry but on. Um, press freedom here. Yes, there are concerns. Uh, journalist died uh, a few months ago in Northern Ireland um, uh, when she was covering a riot. It wasn't a targeted attack on her, but she was killed in the course of reporting. Uh, and that's a, a reminder that uh, our record here uh, in Western countries is not as good as we would like. I checked where uh, Britain is in the annual Press Freedom Index. We're 33rd. We're behind South Africa, uh, yeah. nicely ahead of the United States, a long way ahead of India, which is 140th yes. 40, yeah. out of 180. But the problems here which have been identified are lack of protection to whistleblowers, um, an excessive invocation of national security to uh, stop investigative journalism, the lack of a good business model for independent journalism, and the increasing and I think malign corporate influence, uh, particularly in the national newspaper industry and the rise of populism, the great divisive issue of Brexit has polarized the media. We've got declining levels of confidence in mainstream media. Digital media is expanding. Uh, a lot of it is good. Quite a bit of it isn't. And good digital journalism does not yet have a secure business model. So I think all these are reasons for concern. I tend to be uh, an optimist, or at least, at least I'm more glass half full than glass half empty. But there are some real profound problems affecting the media. And there's no doubt that confidence in journalism and journalists mm. uh, is declining in the UK. So is the problem as much with journalism as with all these objective factors and the times that we are living in, in the sense that do you think technologically, the kind of journalism uh, we believed in, uh, the practice of journalism is uh, obsolete. Uh, is it relevant anymore for the millennial generation? Is it journalism, are the values of journalism that we uh, are uh, wedded to uh, as, as, re as relevant today? Um, or has there been a huge paradigm shift? And uh, maybe uh, just as a liberal democracy seems to be in the dock, uh, journalism too seems to uh, must 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 ha have a makeover, and probably we need a more social media kind of uh, journalism which pans out to to the citizen and uh, where the citizen is a journalist and so on. I mean, do you see? Because it seems to be in a state of flux, isn't it? Or or are, or are we overreacting to the situation? Uh, I mean, yes, it is in a state of flux, and journalism needs to change. And you can't simply repeat the old shibboleths and think that they're all. Uh, you know, valid for a new and, and primarily digital and on-demand uh, uh, landscape. On the other hand, I mean, I spent my career working for the BBC. The BBC sure. still has in Britain, uh, I mean, not quite, I mean, uh, if you look at people who consume something of the BBC, almost universal reach here in uh, the UK. Sure. It's an emphatic monopoly. Um, the BBC and other broadcasters here are obliged by law to be politically impartial in the way in which they report news and current affairs. That isn't something that uh, newspapers are obliged to do. So mm -hmm. newspapers here are raucous and partisan. But that's something which means that there is more confidence in, in mm -hmm. broadcasters here than I think there are in, in other parts of the world, certainly in, in the US. And I think in India, where the, the you know, broadcast news is very shrill. On the other hand, look how sensitive this is. This is um, our best-selling uh, daily newspaper. <laughs> yes. It's the Sun. I'll it's buy the, more. the Murdoch yes. newspaper. This I'll. is yesterday's edition. Uh, its yes. headline is Kyle Bile, even more vile. It's I'll, about yes. a sort of shock jock type TV presenter. Um, yes. Does that inform citizenry? Does that speak to high standards in journalism? Mm. Well, no, it doesn't.
Yeah, we'll, we'll pick up the threads, uh, but at the risk of breaking your, the train of your thought, there was, there was a question from someone which had popped up, and when we were showing the newspaper, I think we will just put it away. If you can get back to that question, there we are. This is a question from Hidayat Parmar, who wants to know, uh, and I'll, I think you can see it, but I'll read it. Corbyn, yeah. uh, Jeremy Corbyn, Labour Party said 71% of UK newspapers are controlled by just three moguls. The UK press is the least trusted in Europe. We have a corrupt corporate media in uh, hock with the Tories. Uh, what's your view, sir, on this? Uh, I think that's slightly overstated, but I think broadly it's correct. So Rupert right. Murdoch owns The Sun, which I just showed you the front page of, yeah. and he yeah. also owns The Times. Um, uh, the Daily Telegraph, which is the main right of centre quality broadsheet daily paper, the only technically the only broadsheet left that uses the old broadsheet Style, uh, size of, of print is up for sale. It's been owned for uh, a decade or more by a, a slightly secretive uh, twin brothers who are, uh, there's no doubt about it, uh, cheerleaders for Brexit and on the right. And there's no doubt that the, uh, that, that, the, um, that the newspapers, the national newspapers, tend to be more right wing, more corporate minded and indeed more pro Brexit. On the other hand, we do have The Guardian, uh, which is very much in the mould of The New York Times or indeed The Hindu. That is funded by through a trust. Uh, so it is uh, independent in its financing. Uh, it does do quality journalism. It does do investigative journalism. But it only sells 140,000 copies a day. So 10 copies of The Sun sell for every one copy of The Guardian. And that's not because of distribution. It is in part right. because of cost. The Guardian costs four times more than the Sun. Right. But it is right. because actually the demand for quality journalism isn't there in the same way. I think mm. the really worrying thing, though, is the is the collapse of the regional press. Mm. So the old regional newspapers based in Leeds or Edinburgh or Manchester or Birmingham, many of them have gone or, or are in sharp decline. Their circulation is now often only a few tens of thousands. And that means the level of political scrutiny and accountability which the regional press provided and the national press can't provide locally in the same way is more or less absent. I think all these things are worrying. The difficulty, though, is what do you do about it? I don't think anybody wants to see national control of the media, certainly of the print media. The BBC mm. is, is sort of publicly owned, but not state owned it's not a state voice in the way that all india radio would be in in, in india or or doordashan um, sure. so how do you encourage a business model which allows genuinely independent fearless brave investigative journalism we all want to see that but the business model is insecure you can't simply pump state money in and the digital landscape is still settling and very few people are willing to pay for digital news. And until people are willing to subscribe to news websites, then how can you actually have a secure method of funding quality journalism for digital platforms? Mm. Yes, of course, the BBC, as you mentioned, is, is a unique case, a unique institution and highly valued. And I think very far more valuable today because when all the rest is corporatized and commoditized, so to speak. Uh, but is there in England a sense of a credibility crisis uh, that journalism is, uh, is suffering because the people are not believing what journalists say uh, as much anymore. Uh, uh, so it, 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 what you see, for instance, across the world, whether it's Trump or Modi here, I'm not so sure whether uh, this happens in England as well, is that the head of state or the prime minister, the president, tweets in the morning and that willy-nilly becomes the the headlines because it's, a, it, it's, it's the political, uh, you know, the, the top notch political person who's speaking. And so you're removing the intermediate role of the press. I mean, you're actually speaking directly to the constituency of your voters, uh, of, your, of, the, of the public sphere, if you like. Uh, so, has, uh, so is there a situation where the people say uh, journal, the, you know, politicians may be bad, but journalists are no better? I mean, do you, is that happening? In India, sometimes we strongly feel that's happening. We're not quite at that stage. And right. Boris Johnson doesn't tweet, for example, in the way that Narendra Modi or, or Donald right. Trump uh, do. Um, he gives news conferences. He gives interviews to the news media, both sympathetic and hostile. But mm. yes, there is uh, uh, something of a crisis of confidence in what uh, President Trump would call the MSM, the mainstream media. 
I mean, mm. even if you look at the BBC and its coverage of, of the biggest issue here by far in, in public life and politics, Brexit and the issue of leaving the European Union, um, the, um, the uh, pro-Remainers, uh, the people who are opposed to Brexit, will say, why is the BBC going, giving so much airtime to people expressing views uh, supporting Brexit, which are irrational, not based on facts, opinionated, uh, I, I mean, and sort of not worthy of serious consideration. Mm -hmm. And the Brexiteers will say, why is it that we always feel that the, the sort of the basic common sense wisdom of the BBC and of its presenters is pro-Remain, reflecting the liberal metropolitan elite outlook? And really, both those viewpoints have a certain amount of truth in them. And it's mm -hmm. very difficult in an increasingly polarised landscape for mm -hmm. uh, forms of news media which try to steer and uh, navigate a way through the middle to, remain the, uh, to retain the confidence of both sides. And the right. BBC and other forms of uh, uh, independent news media are finding that very difficult indeed. I don't know once whether the Brexit issue is resolved. There'll be a sense of coming together. I suspect there won't be because the polarisation in politics and public life, which we see not just in Britain, but in the United States, we see it in India, we see it in Brazil, we see it in many countries, I suspect is something that's here to stay. The other concern that I think uh, is common to India and the UK, it's certainly very big in India today as I speak, uh, that of invasion of privacy of individuals, particularly those who tend to be critical of the government. Uh, in, the, in the UK, we know we went through a phase where a Murdoch, Murdoch owned uh, a newspaper uh, exceeded those limits of privacy and there was a whole investigation and a process and a judge. Uh, and, and there, there were landmark kind of procedures uh, which, which followed. Uh, is, it, has, has that lesson been learned or would, would journalists uh, not uh, cross that critical line anymore? Is, 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 is privacy become a sacred principle in, in the public uh, sphere in, in, in England? Uh, no, it hasn't. The lesson has been learned to some degree. So the, the, the Murdoch newspaper, the News of the World, yeah. closed down because yeah. it was so tainted by the phone hacking scandal where journalists, and not just from the News of the World, but from a number of tabloid and one or two non-tabloid newspapers were illegally hacking into public figures, celebrities, voicemails to get stories and to get leads on stories. I mean, I think that... Uh, custom, as I'm, I'm afraid it was, seems to have been stopped. But it doesn't mean that there is a much greater respect for privacy. And it's a difficult line to draw because mm -hmm. public figures are often answerable uh, about aspects of their personal life. Um, on the other hand, we've seen we've got an, a general election coming up in a few weeks time. There's a, a whole raft of, of uh, young talented members of parliament, many of them women, who've said they're not going to stand for election again because they're uh, appalled by the lack of privacy they enjoy and also the trolling they receive, I mean, mainly from individuals, uh, political opponents who uh, cross all boundaries of decency and respect, but also sometimes from uh, you know, elements of the news media as well. And I think that's a real concern. Right. Andrew, finally, you, you spend a lot of time in India and certainly in other parts of Asia, perhaps, and you know what's happening in the West and in, particularly in the UK. Um, what, when you come to India and look at the media here and when you're leaving London and coming here, uh, what, what is it that strikes you that, uh, as the big difference you know, in, in the newspapers here? Uh, because what you just showed, the newspaper that you showed us, uh, I mean, there are, there, are, there are equivalents here as well. Uh, but what is the big difference? What's the essential difference? Uh, I, think, um, I think the news media in India is more politically pliant. I think mm -hmm. there's more uh, you know, buying of editorial influence and new space by both political parties and corporates. And I think that is uh, shameful. I think uh, a lot of the uh, mid-market and down-market news channels don't do news, they do rows, and I think that's rather a different sort of thing. It's a form of blood sport rather than creating a, an informed citizenry. But as I say, I, I am 
glass half full. So when I come to India, I, I watch NDTV, I uh, read the Hindu, I uh, go every day to the wire. Uh, when I could, I would also go and, and follow what's happening in Kashmir through the uh, daily papers there, whose websites have now been frozen since August the 5th. So there's lots of positive, positive things happening. And I, I teach, as you know, at the ACJ, and I, yes. I find the students there really do understand what makes good journalism. There may be times in their careers that they can't actually pursue that in the way that they want because of what's expected from their platforms or employers, but they know what good journalism is. And I think there's a lot of good journalism in India, and I'm, on the whole, resilient and optimistic about the future. Thank you. That's, that's a good note to end this. Thank you very much, Andrew, for joining us, and uh, uh, we hope to see you soon in, back in Chennai. Yeah. And thank you for taking the time. Thank you. My pleasure. So that was uh, Andrew Whitehead. Uh, from London, a very experienced veteran broadcaster, publisher, writer, author, uh, who was telling us uh, about what's yeah. happening in his own context and uh, what he thinks are the core values, cardinal principles of journalism that we should keep in focus, in sharp focus. Uh, and uh, this is uh, even more difficult in these days when uh, the, uh, uh, the when we have kinds of, we have journalism and journalism and journalism. As Andrew hinted, and as we know too well in India, in the Indian context, uh, there are um, uh, there's a big section of the media, electronic media, uh, less so perhaps in the print media, uh, but certainly electronic and digital media, uh, who play the uh, master's voice, who uh, uh, are cat's paw of, the, of, of those in power, who uh, who, who proactively other a good section of the population, uh, stigmatize a good section of the population uh, on religious or ethnic or uh, caste considerations uh, and, um, and, and, and play a, a divisive rather than a, a, a cohesive or a, a unifying role. And uh, if that is journalism, uh, then you need another force or another um, social remedy to, to, to be a corrective to that kind of journalism, and uh, th which also makes uh, people worried about uh, what journalism is all about. Um, so in our conversation so far, we've had some very interesting uh, viewpoints from, uh, from India, from uh, about Sri Lanka, and we have been to the UK as well. Uh, we are hoping to be joined uh, shortly from uh, other parts of the world uh, by, uh, by, by um, uh, Experts by veterans and journalists from other parts of the world, and uh, and carry this uh, carry ho this whole discussion forward. I'm just receiving news that we are going to go now uh, to uh, Uganda to Kampala, uh, where we have Kaneri Mugume joining us from Kampala, uh, and uh, we we should be, he should be up on our screen very soon. Uh, and uh, he's a news reporter, an investigative journalist with uh, NBS Television. There we are. Hello, Kaneri Mugume. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to have you here with us. This is Sashi Kumar, and uh, thank you for joining us uh, from Kampala. Uh, I was just introducing you and saying you were a news reporter, investigative journalist with the NBS television covering East Africa, uh, news anchor of the Daybreaker Bulletin, the NBS Sunrise. Uh, his focus areas include regional politics, digital media, and the role of journalism in changing perceptions in Africa. Uh, you've also moderated dialogues at the Uganda Social Media Conference, the annual Refugee Conference, and the Economic Forum in Kampala. So welcome to this global conversation on the freedom of the press. Uh, in your part of the world, and uh, from all that you've seen uh, happening uh, around the world, uh, how would you evaluate uh, the, the status of, of the free press, uh, uh, you know, it, it, would you say, characterize it as uh, just be belabor, belabored, uh, beleaguered or belabored or in a state of crisis? Uh, uh, are there strong uh, indications that journalism as we respect and uh, know it and value it uh, may be difficult to follow in the days ahead? Or is this a time to uh, resist and make sure that uh, the journalism uh, shall try that we will uh, we will we will see a brighter future in which journalists would have played a role 
Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kumar. First of all, I'll begin with uh, telling you the state of uh, the freedom of journalism or the press in East Africa, which is the area that I cover. Um, I think we are in a crisis and a huge crisis because uh, what is happening, for example, in Uganda, we've uh, been going through uh, a, a crisis created by the state. One, I've been a victim before early this year. We did a huge broadcast of uh, events that have to do with opposition figures. And uh, I was personally asked by the state to step down from my job, um, which is like sort of the suspension. Of course, uh, the the company or media house that I work for did not agree to that because they told the state they did not have authority to pass on such a suspension to me. Um, but then they, later on, we also see that uh, there are physical attacks on the press. We are covering a protest by university students recently in this week, and uh, a number of journalists were beaten and left hospitalized. I was also a victim of, of that sort of violence, um, you know, mated to us by the state security forces. Um, my camera was taken away by uh, the Uganda police and uh, we got into some sort of a fight uh, because I was trying to secure my camera. So I would say the state of the freedom of the press in East Africa is actually in a crisis. Recently, um, towards uh, the end of this week, the association or the umbrella body that brings together journalists actually did uh, go ahead and uh, announce that they are going to boycott all activities by the police and the military. All PR activities are going to boycott them because usually they call us for press conferences and then we go so they can talk about what they have been able to achieve in the week and, and whatnot. So the Journalists Association is saying that we're not going to broadcast all these events until there is a mutual understanding of sort of environment that should be created between uh, the, how the journalists operate and how the security forces operate. And media said they are not going to cover any police activity. So th th that's how bad it is and that's how bad it has gotten to this state. And then uh, for, for over 10 years, there is an organization in Uganda called the Human Rights Network for Journalists. They have been conducting surveys and, and, and um, looking at uh, the state of the press freedom. For the 10th year, Mr. Kumar, for the 10th year, the Uganda police and uh, the army uh, were ranked as uh, the highest abuser of media rights for the 10th year consecutively. Uh, and, and, and for me, this is very important because the state is the one that is supposed to be protecting us. But then if it is the state, then now abusing our rights, I would say it's in a crisis. I, I don't know how much of an impact the boycott on media on police activities is going to create, um, you know, in this whole week as, uh, you know, events go on. I do not know what sort of impact it's going to create, but I think that's one step towards reclaiming our freedom, trying to say that we are tired of the violence, we are tired of disrespect of rights of the journalists. It is, it is, it is a voice we are trying to put out there because if we are able to be a voice for the voiceless of the people in society, the people whose problems that we broadcast on television and newspapers and digital print, what about us? Who is going to voice our concerns? And for me, Mr. Kumar, that's the most important conversation. What can we do to make sure that our voice is heard and that we can do our work freely without being interfered with, without being beaten and left hospitalized? Kumar. That uh, Kanuri Mukume is very, very evocative. What you've just told us is very serious and very evocative. And uh, it, it, it seems to be in, 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 in a serious crisis, as you say. But tell me, when you say media rights, uh, are these rights enshrined in the constitution in Uganda? Uh, uh, what are the rights? Are they, or are they rights that, uh, that you derive by virtue of being a professional journalist, which are, which are uh, uh, available to any, any citizen who's a, who's a journalist? Are there prescribed rights for journalism in Uganda? So when you say violation of media rights, uh, could, you, could you explain that a bit more? I mean, first of all, as human beings, I think uh, we enjoy sure. the right of being a citizen of Uganda. For example, uh, I do not see why violence should be made known to me if there is any cause of arrest, because this, the constitution stipulates it very well that should anyone be, uh, you know, a suspect and needs to be arrested, then the police should be able to hand over the warrant of arrest and then state the reasons of arrest and then can take me to jail freely without, you know, any violence made into me. So, first of all, as a Ugandan, I have the right one made by the security forces. And then when you also look into the Media Act, for example, um, 
the constitution clearly states uh, the, the rights of the journalists in the Media Act. It stipulates that um, inside, inside the Media Act, it shows that uh, when I was suspended, for example, early this year for broadcasting events of the opposition, uh, it was very, very illegal because it is not written anywhere that the state or, for example, the communication authority here in Uganda can go on and request a media house or order them to suspend one of their staff. It is stipulated very well in the constitution that should any activity be broadcast on TV and breaches, uh, you know, the minimum broadcasting standards, there should be a conversation between the media house and uh, the communication authority, which is in this case what we call the Uganda Communications Commission uh, Authority, that is the regulatory authority. They should have a conversation and then every journalist should be given uh, the right to be heard or be given a fair hearing. You do not, first of all, one, commit an illegality by suspending a journalist from the media house because they do not work for the state, they work for a private media house. And then two, go ahead and order over 39 journalists to be suspended from 13 media houses. That is for me the most important conversation. How do you order, you know, the suspension of journalists inside a private media house? So the Media Act really stipulates our rights really, really well that in case of breach of minimum broadcasting standards, there should be a conversation held, there should be an investigation conducted, and journalists should be given the fair hearing to defend themselves. Indeed, if there was uh, um, some minimum broadcasting standards that were breached, then we should be able to know whether that, that goes to court, whether it was a defamation or whether it was uh, broadcasting. But when, when you just write a letter and suspend journalists, that is not formal, that is not legal in any way, and the Constitution really protects our rights. Right. Uh, before we continue the discussion, there's, a, there's one of our followers on this conversation asking you a question. Uh, here we have another one popping up, Anushri Jonko, who wants to know, the Uganda Communications Commission investigates media houses regarding violation of minimum broadcasting standards. What are these standards? I think you were, you were, you were touching on these, but would you like to address this question? Yes, yes, absolutely. There are standards as us. Uh, first of all, the Uganda Communications Commission is not supposed to investigate uh, the media houses regarding any violation of minimum broadcasting standards. That is not their, their part of the job because then we go to the media council. The media council is one in charge of any investigation should any media house violate any minimum broadcasting standards. And then two, what are these standards? First of all, the standards are stipulated very well in, 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 in the Media Act and uh, they touch on how, you know, media houses should be able to broadcast events without giving undue prominence to anyone and is one of them. We have to look into the conversation of uh, what happens when, uh, for example, someone dies somewhere and then you have to broadcast their names on television. The issue of consent broadcasting, for example, uh, news about children uh, who are below the age of 18. The sort of media, the sort of standards, um, you know, in broadcasting that are global. We share those global standards, uh, seeking for consent from parents of any child whom you're going to broadcast uh, and is below 18. Some of those standards are really, really shared by a global, global, um, uh, other global countries, so they're not uniquely uh, specified for Uganda. I, I, I want to uh, really, really articulate that. Could you give, give us a better sense of how this works in, in, in Uganda? Uh, there, there must be, of course, there is a mainstream press of which you are a part, and there must also be the burgeoning social media, uh, and uh, which is a parallel kind of media. Uh, how okay. vibrant or how influential is the social media? Is it uh, Does it play a check and balance role vis-a-vis -vis the mainstream media? Uh, is the establishment worried about the way social media pans out, or does it use the social media uh, to for disinformation or fake news, as, as, we, as we call it? Could you give us a sense of the media ecology and what are the big elements or the dominant elements in that ecology? Well, the, the social media, I think what, has, what it has brought is um, the emerging global voices and it even checks us, who, the journalists, if we provide information, we are no longer the monopoly for information. So what social media has brought is uh, mass sources of information. But then social media does not have the responsibility to be the check 
right? It does not, it does not verify information because no one is responsible for that. I think what we as traditional media houses have done is uh, uh, be that element in, in information that verifies and checks information, whether it is right or wrong, and then be the disseminator of the right information. Anything can be posted on social media and anyone can believe it. But social media does not have the guidelines of checking and verifying information. What we as broadcasting media houses do in Uganda is that we have several layers of verification of news. When a news story comes in, we verify each and every word, each and every fact, each and every sentence, which social media does not have. So social media has been good in terms of, uh, it, it has created many avenues and provision of information. And I can say and, and, and admit this, that some of the information that we broadcast on television um, actually comes from social media because those are some of the ways we get the tips. But it does not have that responsibility of verification. So we've been very fundamental as traditional media houses in terms of verification of news because we have several layers. We have editors, we have producers, we have fact checkers, we have online editors, which social media does not have. So the idea of the emerging social media has been good in one way and then bad in one in the other way because then anything can be put up. We found ourselves in a tricky position where we just have to, uh, for example, when a news story comes up, the public holds us accountable. Is this true? They run to us. They never go back to social media to ask people who posted that information whether it is true or false. They run to right. us because they know that they have created trust in us. They know that we have several layers of verification of information. And therefore, that's where social media has been an, of an advantage to us. But in one way or another, we tend to shift our focus from the real news and then we tend to go to the verification of information that has come from social media. But faced by, as you hinted or mentioned, uh, inimical state, uh, uh, which, which tends to have a chilling effect on the media, what is yeah. the media's recourse? Is it the strength, the solidarity of the mainstream media, of the journalists, of the um, uh, you know, media practitioners? Or uh, is it the judiciary, which, uh, which uh, uh, tends to protect the rights of the media? Uh, or is it, a, is it a purely uphill struggle where being a journalist is asking for trouble? Uh, sorry, I did not get your question very well. Sorry. So, so uh, uh, you know, given an inimical state, as you have mentioned in in Uganda, uh, what is it that uh, journalists can uh, can rely on? Is it the fraternity, the solidarity of the media organizations, or practicing journalists, uh, or is it the fact that the judiciary uh, would uh, look at uh, issues that uh, of, of, of violation of journalistic rights or media freedoms uh, 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 carefully uh, and, and legally? Uh, could you, or is it, or is it that this is an uphill task where being a journalist in your context is really asking for trouble? That is true. Sometimes being a journalist is calling for trouble itself. And that has been very evident in some of the programs that we do. You broadcast a program and uh, then they come for you, as, as, as we always see here. Earlier on, I talked about the, the standards of uh, broadcasting. Uh, for example, the state will tell you part of the standards is that uh, some programs in news should not undermine public security, should not incite violence. Um, some programs should not on crime and violence should not be able to be cynical or, or such programs should not incite or glamorize violence and portray it in a good way. Those are some of the standards I'm talking about. Or they will tell you that content pertaining to sex and nudity or including other programs, let's say on HIV AIDS, uh, should, should, should not offend against the good taste or decency. Those are some of the things that we sort of be careful when we are broadcasting and those are part of the standards. But then I think for me, the protection of journalists begin with ourselves, it is standing in solidarity with our fellow journalists. When, um, for example, the umbrella body of journalists calls for a boycott of all police activities, we are going to show support by, you know, adhering to that call. Yes. I think the judiciary has been very, very silent. For example, the judiciary cannot present you a report on the number of cases of uh, journalists' of violence, uh, rather journalists' assaults that have they have been working on or they have completed in the past years. They do not have such information and they have never presented us such information. They want to present us information and other things and then we cover them. So I think for me, 
the number one factor on the protection of journalists begins with standing in solidarity with our fellow journalists. Um, when one of our journalists was beaten during a protest in August 2018 of an opposition leader, he was beaten by the army. And when we put the army on the spot, they told us that they thought that this is a route as journalist, photojournalist in Uganda. They told us that they thought that this journalist was a camera thief. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. Even mm -hmm. after he had, he had identified himself as a person who belongs to the media and had been practicing in Uganda for the last 15 years. We stood in solidarity with him. We broadcast events around him. We put the army on sport and police and government, make sure that one pays, its, pays his bill and then yeah. two, make sure that uh, they buy a new, the new equipment for him that they had destroyed during the protest and make sure that they take care of him. But then in the, in the bigger picture, to make sure that the protection of journalists is guaranteed in the field. They want to do all these crimes, cracking down on protests, which is, you know, something that uh, they use with a lot of violence and which is, a, which is really called for. So they want to do all that in the dark and yeah. they don't want journalists to cover them. So number one protection is not running to the judiciary, is not sitting down on round tables with police. It is standing in solidarity as journalists and then I think the biggest, um, I can say the weakness we've had as journalists in Uganda is uh, the fact that we've been, we've failed completely. We failed to come up as one, as one in one, in, in one body or as, for example, in Kenya, which is another country in East Africa here, they have an editor's yeah. guild, which is really a body of all the editors in Kenya. When they right. come together and say, this is our tech, even yeah. the owners of businesses of media houses, they will not say anything beyond that. So that sort of uh, solidarity that is solid and can be able to put out one voice and is respected is, I think, for me, what is lacking in Uganda and something that we're working on as time goes on. Thank you. But uh, it's, it's wonderful to hear you. Uh, um, the, 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 the passion and animation that you bring to journalism must, uh, must I'm sure, inspire a lot of uh, 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 young journalists. Thank you very much, Kenneri Mugume. Uh, more power to your elbow and uh, may journalism make a difference in Kampala and Uganda in the days, months or years ahead. Thank you for, for being with us. Thank you very much. So that was Kenneri Mugume from Kampala and Uganda who was telling us about a uh, very uh, difficult situation, uh, professional journalists uh, who uh, face in, 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 in the country uh, from the state and uh, the challenges they live with uh, on a daily basis. Let's move now to a different continent, uh, uh, to uh, all the way to Australia, where we will be joined by uh, Robin Jeffrey, uh, media scholar, reputed media scholar, uh, and uh, uh, who's, a, who's a friend of India. He's, in fact, looked at Indian media uh, in very strongly. Hello, Robin. It's lovely to have you with us. And I'm sorry, it must be well past your bedtime in <laughs> No, no, I've been, I've been up like Andrew watching the Rugby World Cup finals. Oh, you have. All right. Okay. Your, timing is, your timing's been brilliant. You've uh, let me watch the complete match and see it all. And now I've got this lovely opportunity to talk to you. So I'm having Thank a very you. good evening. Thank you very much. And it's, it's great to see you, uh, as always. Uh, and I was just uh, beginning to introduce you for... For, for our um, followers on, on, on this program. Uh, Robin Jeffrey, um, Canadian-born professor whose primary research interests are modern history and politics of India. Uh, he's interested in media studies. He's, in fact, uh, an eminent scholar of the media, and he's uh, emeritus professor of La Trobe University, uh, Australian National University, and he was, or he still chairs, an advisory panel on the Austria, Australia India Institute within the University of Melbourne. In Australia, and I might add that uh, he has come to the Asian College of Journalism more than once, and uh, given us the benefit of his uh, of his deep uh, understanding and knowledge of the way media is evolving. He's done some seminal work in terms of the media in the southern state of Kerala in India, and he continues to be uh, update himself. I think his last work we he I heard him on was on on the way digital media is happening and the and the and the and the, and the social or the cultural consequences of. Uh, the way digital media is panning out. So it's it's really wonderful, uh, Robin, to see that you're on top of it, as always. And uh, as you know, we, now, we are now speaking on an issue that uh, is of growing concern to all of us across the world, uh, here in India, uh, we, despairingly so, that of uh, the freedom of the fourth press, of the fourth estate of the media, and uh, on the occasion of uh, 
uh, crying a, or, or seeking to cry a halt to impunity for those who attack journalists. Uh, I know that as I speak, Australia is going through a very interesting phase because uh, you've had since uh, uh, the 21st of October, uh, you've had this, uh, uh, this, this reaction from the media. I think where, where you see redacted uh, front pages of the newspapers uh, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the, the fact that uh, one would have thought that Australia being a mature democracy is insulated somewhat like England or uh, some other countries from from uh, uh, shall we say depredations on the role of the press, but uh, between 75 to 82 national security laws have been enacted. So we read because Australia is in focus now since September 2001, and um, there is a Media Freedom Act uh, being prop uh, being being I think proposed, and uh, um, uh, the, 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 there's a coalition of I think the media organisations uh, trying to challenge the government and. Uh, and make the public aware of what the issues at stake are. Uh, this kind of collaborative journalism probably is, is the way forward for the rest of the world, particularly in areas where media is as vulnerable as it is, I think, in, uh, in, in present-day India. But Robin, could you speak to what's happening in Australia? And from your no deep knowledge of India and indeed of journalism in other parts of the world, uh, where do you see journalism since you've been tracking this, uh, this beast for a long time now? Uh, and how do you see the way forward? Well, you picked a, a very opportune week to be raising this for an, for Australian audiences, yeah. I think, uh, uh, Shashi, because on Monday, this coalition of virtually all media groups, as, as some of your viewers will know, um, the Australian media is very tightly held, and the major dailies, Mur the Murdoch Press, News Limited, have, I think, somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of daily circulation in the metropolitan cities, and the other chain... Uh, is now called Nine, and that's the result of a merger with the TV partner being the dominant partner of the Channel Nine network with the old Fairfax News organization. So they, they've been allowed to combine. The, the barrier between television and uh, print has been withdrawn. So there's now an institution called Nine. In any case, the, the Murdoch people have gone in, in, including even Sky, which is there is the kind of Fox uh, Fox News of Australia. Even Sky is in on this coalition of probably, I think, 15 major media or the major media organizations. And they're running something called Australia's Right to Know. And I'm just going to hold up um, a page that's been running in all the metropolitan dailies this week. They've been using right. a different one every every day. And it's right. a redacted text of the kind they're getting back from government when they try to use the Freedom of Information Act. And I'll hold that up just in case you can see the uh, yes. the tags on it and the uh, website that people can go to. Um, yeah. In any case, uh, this has been provoked by uh, raids, particularly uh, by raids in June on the uh, on a journalist who uh, you uh, ran a story on the excesses of the Australian Taxation Office, which is a government agency, um, which uh, came from a, a whistleblower. And they, these were followed by raids on the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, Australia's equivalent of the BBC. Um, when the coppers came in and with the warrants they had, they were able to cart away drawers full of files, whether they were related to their inquiry or not, they wouldn't have known at the time they were carting them away. So this was real heavy handed stuff. And yes. it has had the effect of galvanizing all the media organizations into this campaign that's run all week long. It's now running a website uh, asking for uh, some sort of legislation, not necessarily legislation, but some decent guarantees that this kind of uh, intimidation, because it's clear these are messages to journalists, do not mess with the government. And it's also messages to possible whistleblowers, do not wet mess and get involved with this or we will put you away for a very long time. So it's, it's a pretty insidious kind of campaign for a country mm -hmm. that's thought to be, you know, a bastion of liberal democracy. Yes, and that's that's very interesting. In fact, I was I was looking at the Press Freedom Index, uh, where India, of course, is way down at 140. But um, uh, I noticed that Australia is 21st, which is not too bad. Yeah. But what was even more remarkable is your neighbor, neighbor New Zealand is seventh in that list. So uh, New Zealand seems to be faring rather well compared to Australia in terms of press freedom. But they also have a lovely prime minister. They uh, yes, they, they do. Yes. 
So the most admirable prime minister. It makes a, it makes a difference when uh, when someone at the top is more enlightened and liberal. Yes, uh, yeah. but but Robin, uh, wh why and how is a state so emboldened or the establishment so emboldened to encroach on press freedoms? Is it that there's been a shift in perception in terms of does? Is it that in the larger public sphere or in the in the in in in, in the public realm, uh, journalism may not be seen as a value worth protecting, uh, of, you know, against the depredations of the state? Uh, I would imagine there was a time when if you did something like this against journalists in mature democracies, the people would be up in arms, uh, the civil society would be up in arms. But obviously, something has changed. The well. <laughs> As you were speaking, I was thinking of General Sherman, the uh, American general during the Civil War, who called journalists spies and defamers, All lying, right. infamous okay. lying dogs. So, you know, the profession has had a, a spotted history in yeah, some okay. way. I don't think we've got back to quite that in, uh, in Australia. But it's uh, the government, of course, says we're protecting Australians. The line is we're not acting to suppress journalists. We want journalists to do their work as we tell them and, you know, unstated, we want journalists to do their work, but we have a duty to protect Australians. And so we're being protected by these sorts of raids and the ability of government to redact just about anything that may involve, embarrass someone high enough up in authority. Um, and part of this, of course, is the outcome of uh, 2001, 9-11, uh, which led to those numerous pieces of legislation that you just referred to. Uh, that, I suppose, is no surprise. The Americans have had their Patriot Acts and so on similarly. But the Americans, unlike Australians, uh, have a First Amendment to the Constitution, which yeah. in very explicit terms guarantees the freedom of the press and freedom of speech and makes it very difficult to impose some of the strictures that have been imposed in Australia in the United States. The, the Constitution would be immediately invoked. We don't have a, a Bill of Rights here. Unlike the Canadians, we don't have a Charter of Rights. The New Zealanders have a Bill of Rights. We have nothing quite like that in Australia. All our liberal freedoms are defended simply by tradition and pieces of legislation which Parliament can choose to amend. So we are vulnerable, I think, in, in that way. And Australia is an old colonial society like India. The other thing that's interesting that's been going on this week um, is the proposal of the Prime Minister that we need legislation that will prevent the boycott, the advocacy of boycotts of major enterprises. So to say that a bank should not invest in a coal mine, this is particularly with reference to Adani coal mine, uh, right. to do that should be illegal. So it's taking us back almost to the days of Satyagraha, you know, where civil disobedience is in yes. the streets and governments are saying you must not do these things because they they harm the state and we are here to protect the state. Yes. So it, 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 these are change conditions. The, yes, yes and, and, the, and the newspapers that you held up uh, reminded me of some of our newspapers during the days of the emergency where they had just black uh, patches there instead of an editorial or <laughs> headlines and so on. Yes, yes. So, but the, is this is this a phase? Would you call this phase uh, an aberration uh, that that has to pass, or is it, uh, or do, or will things get worse before they get better? I, I think they'll get worse before they get better because the uh, as your as Andrew Whitehead was saying, yeah. your uh, it's so difficult now to maintain a media organization because the, the revenue flow is not there. The the great Fairfax newspapers of Australia twenty five years ago had where it's Saturday today and you used to have to carry the Saturday newspaper, a Fairfax Saturday newspaper. You needed a little trolley to bring it into the house. It had so much classified advertising in it, a little bit like the old Sunday New York Times. Uh, that is just not the case today. I think the age, which is our newspaper in Melbourne, is down to something like 150,000 copies a day, uh, 150,000 copies on the weekend for a city of 5 million people. Uh, that's the, the quality daily. The Herald Sun, which is the Murdoch tabloid, is probably still around 250,000, 300,000. But uh, those circulations, the selling price is not making money. As we know, it's the advertising that makes the money. And how do you raise ads uh, as a uh, a media organization in the digital world. Very, very hard. Hard enough for the big ones. The Guardian, I think, may make a go of it. The New York Times, 
uh, Washington Post probably are now returning a decent income stream. But what about the regional papers? Again, Andrew Whitehead was talking about the regional press yes. in Australia, very much a crisis, just as it is uh, in most uh, of North America. I know very hard to keep uh, the, the small local dailies going. Probably you'll keep the Toronto Globe and Mail alive, but will you keep the Times colonist in Victoria, British Columbia alive? That's a much right. harder uh, right. fiscal ta financial task to perform. Right. The, it's different in India, though, I think, Sashi, where the languages are a help. Yeah, I mean, in, in Kerala, you do have local papers, but they're local editions of Malayala Manorama or Matrabhumi uh, True. True. or Kerala Kaumadi. The, uh, and and yes. that perhaps helps in a way. The, it keeps right. some kind of media closer to the to people. That's true. There's, there's a greater kind of contact, I think, with, with the people. Yeah. Uh, 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 Robin, but as far as journalists are concerned in, in Australia, uh, uh, I'm sure they, they are not under physical threat like they are, seem to be inc increasingly in India. And of course, as we've seen in other places in South Asia uh, and in Uganda, we just heard from our friend in Uganda from Kampala, uh, where there is a physical threat of elimination or uh, uh, injury to life or limb, I mean, uh, or being incarcerated. Uh, uh, Journalists still have that latitude, the freedom to work and to, crit to crit criticize the state. Of course, there are consequences which seem more legal than uh, physical. Yeah, I think the, the real threat is the one, the, the raid by the Australian Federal Police in June on uh, a, a News Limited journalist, a young woman, was mm -hmm. into her home. And the, the, she had large policemen wandering around her house emptying drawers for a, a couple of hours. Now, that's, that's a kind of physical intimidation. And right. any other young woman, I, I have people I've worked with in the past who are women in their 20s, 30s and 40s who yeah. work for news organizations. They, they, that's now in the back of their minds, too. Do I really want three or four uh, policemen wandering through my house on a Saturday morning? Because sure. of a story I've written, they, uh, so it, it's certainly different from being murdered uh, as you park your motor yeah. scooter in yeah. front of your house. But yeah. they, uh, thank you, uh, thank you very much, Robin, and uh, it's it's been it's a pleasure talking to you and 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 very insightful your views, of course. And we we hope to catch up with you again. And you must come back to the ACJ and talk to our students about this and a lot more when you can. Uh, but there's just one question that's cropped up from one of our followers. And we'll just raise this. This is from Priya Rajshekar, who wants, who says, globally endless tech disruption, digital capitalism, including surveillance capitalism and corporatization of the media, have resulted in a devaluation of journalism's public interest role. In this scenario, what is the role of the local newspaper in upholding journalism's normative functions in India, specifically, and the world in general? That's a lot there, but to the extent yeah. that you can. Yeah. Oh, for for me, the, the the difference is the one I've just touched on. That I think India has some advantages in that the regional press does keep uh, means you do have regional media moguls, and it does keep the regional press a little bit closer to the grassroots, and probably gives the regional press a kind of autonomy that the national dailies don't have. It gets under the radar, just as we know during the emergency. The language, the Indian language press often slipped under the radar and occasionally did things that it uh, shouldn't have done. Uh, for the rest of the world, I think it's a, uh, certainly the English speaking world, it's a real challenge because keeping these small local dailies going is, uh, I wouldn't say all impossible, but it's almost impossible. It's extremely difficult. And without them, how do journalists do their work? How do they have the time and the resources to really get on with the job? Uh, Facebook and uh, WhatsApp. Are, are simply not good enough. They're fake news until somebody validates whatever is shooting around on them. So it, it's a huge task and no one has found the answer yet, I think. Right. So thank you very much. Thank you, Robin. And now we'll let you go to sleep. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you very much. Thank you, Sashi. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. So that was uh, Robin Jeffrey, uh, our uh, media expert, scholar from speaking to us from Melbourne. We move on now to uh, Asar Khatab. Uh, and he's going to join us from Lebanon. Uh, he's in Beirut. Uh, Beirut, again, has been going through very uh, dramatic uh, changes uh, recently. The prime minister uh, putting up his resignation, demonstrations in the streets. Um, and uh, we hope Asar Khatab 
uh, who is there in Beirut will be joining us soon. There we are. Hello, Asir Khatab. Uh, good it's afternoon Sashi from Habib. India. And uh, yeah, hello. Uh, this is Sashi Kumar. And thank you for joining this uh, global conference on, on press freedom. Let me fully introduce uh, 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 Asir to all the others who are with us on this program. Uh, he is a reporter of the Washington Post Beirut Bureau, uh, focusing on Syria. He's also been a reporter for the Financial Times, covering Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, and for the Spanish news agency EFE, reporting mainly from Aleppo and Homs. He's on the editorial team of SMEX, which is a Beirut-based organization that works to advance digital rights and self-regulating information societies in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, sir, before we, you joined us, I was just uh, saying that you're going through some very dramatic moments there yourself, and you must be on your toes now with all that's happening in, in Lebanon and Beirut. Uh, what, what is the latest uh, before we get on to the issue of our, of our discussion? Is there anything, anything important or dramatic happening today? Well, um, we were kind of anticipating what's going to happen today because today is the first day of the weekend and um, people have throughout the week. Can you hear me? Yes, of course. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, protests have gone um, a little bit less, fewer in number of people have been going out um, to, the, to the streets throughout the end of la this last week. And we were uh, waiting to see what's going to happen today. Now, I in the main squares in Beirut, we are not seeing as many people as we were seeing um, last week or two weeks ago. But um, there are still so many roads that, have, that are cut across the country. This is a strategy that protesters have uh, been following for the past two weeks. They are shutting down roads, uh, not allowing anything to pass except for urgent uh, emergencies. And uh, this has caused schools, universities, and banks to shut down. They've been shut down for more than 13, 14 days now. Uh, some universities and schools and banks took initiative to reopen uh, as of yesterday, but many are still closed. Uh, we are witnessing um, uh, the wide-scale uh, demonstrations across the country, and every city and every town is witnessing something uh, quite different. Lebanon is, of course, a country that's divided across sectarian lines and uh, religious lines and political lines. And uh, certain cities and uh, provinces are dominated by certain political parties who impose different um, uh, different ways of treating journalists or treating you know, activists or people in general. So the kind of uh, uprising we're seeing in the south, where the Iran-backed Hezbollah is uh, dominant, are uh, different than the ones we're witnessing in Beirut, which is more diverse, it's, it's the capital, and different to Tripoli, the biggest city in the north that is uh, mostly um, Sunni Muslims. So uh, we've been trying to monitor what's been going on across all of these uh, cities, and it's been different uh, the way it's been going on uh, so far. Now, I can't say that uh, it's dying out, because every now and then uh, we're seeing, you know, that the number of people on the streets gets fewer, but then uh, you, uh, something happens, uh, the president, the prime minister, um, the speaker of parliament says something and people are provoked or, you know, something reignites the flame of the revolution. But the people have made this clear. It, for the first time in the modern history of uh, Lebanon, we're seeing people from all around uh, the country, from all religions and sectarian backgrounds, coming together, sharing uh, the same demands, sharing the same frustrations against the government, against the officials, against the corrupt ministers and MPs. And they are not going to, um, you know, accept this anymore. They have made their decision. We've seen uh, on two Sundays ago, we saw around two million people in the streets. And Lebanon is a country of four to six million people. So it's a huge number. And we are used to uh, seeing certain political parties pushing certain uprisings or certain uh, movements, uh, causing the toppling of certain governments. But this time, it's purely the people who have come together. Lebanon was, of course, uh, ravaged by a brutal civil war between 1975 and 1990. That was mainly sectarian. And uh, in 1990, the war stopped, as in the fighting stopped. But so many things, so many aspects of the war were still here, are still here in Lebanon. The sectarianism, the fear of the other, the uh, sort of, you know, avoiding people from certain religions that aren't uh, your religion still very much exists. But many people who we've been talking to on the streets have been telling us that today actually marks the end of the yes. civil war because everyone has come together. Right. Great. Uh, 
what what you said is very significant that for the first time in the history of Lebanon, people, irrespective of their uh, sectarian or religious or other loyalties, are coming out on the streets because there's a common cause that binds them. Them. Does this carry over, or is this reflected in the uh, coverage of this of what's happening there? Are journalists uh, also, um, um, you know, loyal to sectarian, political, or religious, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, on, th on those lines, or, or uh, as this divide, or as this unition, or, or uh, is that a common purpose as far as journalism in Lebanon goes? Because mm -hmm. I'm sure there are big political forces, and there must have been journalists who reflect this or that viewpoint. Uh, is, in short, journalism adding to the problem there, or is it becoming uh, a source of understanding what's happening there? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you give a little bit of a background, uh, the Lebanese media is also very much divided on a uh, sectarian uh, basis. For yeah. the, um, you know, Lebanon has the, something called the confessional system, which means the president has to be from a certain religion, the prime minister from a certain religion, and for, uh, the speaker of parliament from a certain religion. And this applies to many other uh, departments of the state. And the media is hugely private, hugely owned by uh, some of the those who were sectarian warlords during the Lebanese civil war, and now they're party leaders. So. Uh, Hezbollah has their own private TV channel and radio station. Um, the Future Movement, which is led by the uh, now caretaker Frank Prime Minister Saad Hariri, has also they have their own media outlets. And same goes for all of the others. Now, media here in general has been widely sectarian, has been widely uh, pushing sort of um, the certain narratives that certain political leaders want to push, except for a certain TV channels and newspapers who are owned by businessmen. And they have vacillated during the past few years, whether, you know, sometimes the, the, you see news that are more leaning towards the Syrian regime or the Hezbollah axis, or sometimes leaning against that, that same axis. So now we've been seeing that most of the TV stations, most of the, new, uh, of the media outlets have been down there uh, covering these protests, except for, for a few exceptions. We've been say, seeing, now I work for the international media and people, my colleagues in the international media as well are, of course, uh, they're down there, they're covering, they are um, uh, trying, you know, not to be uh, pulled towards the sectarian lines, but we were also looking with uh, huge curiosity on our colleagues in the Lebanese media who have been uh, doing lots of very good work. They've been talking to people, they've been uh, giving, uh, you know, giving the, the population, the, their audience, what is actually happening on the streets. Some of them has, uh, have avoided uh, certain topics or certain demonstrations. Al Manar TV channel, which is owned by Hezbollah, uh, has covered the demonstrations, but they try, of course, to not very much talk about what's happening in the south, in, in Tyre, or in, in certain areas where Hezbollah affiliated uh, or Hezbollah supporters have uh, clamped down on journalists and on, uh, on demonstrators as well. Right. And how free is the media to function, to report, even if on sectarian or on, uh, on the lines of such loyalties? Uh, is there physical threat uh, that faces them? Uh, I mean, are, are there, is there danger to life, uh, to limb? Uh, have, there, have there been incidents of that kind uh, that we should know? So Lebanon has always took pride in, in being um, the only country in the middle, the only democracy in the Middle East, or the only country where there is there are actual freedom of expression, freedom of the press uh, in the region, and um, they this has uh, I, I can't see you anymore. I wonder if you can see and hear me. Hello.
I'm sorry we uh, uh, lost uh, connectivity there. Uh, and to be transparently honest about it, that's because the battery on this machine that I'm sitting on ran out. So we've just connected to power. It's an unforgivable lapse for <laughs> doing a program like this, but that's what happened. And I'm sorry we lost uh, Asar Khatab there. Uh, while he was uh, telling us about how journalism operates in the very troubled conditions uh, where uh, society is divided uh, on, on strong sectarian, religious and political lines. And journalism also reflects those uh, loyalties, uh, that, that kind of fragmentation. Uh, and uh, I, But I think he was, he was coming on to tell us about uh, how, 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 how journalists cope with the situation. Let, let's see if we can get him back. Hello? Yes, uh, sorry, uh, sir, we, 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 uh, there was a slight disruption. Uh, when we lost you, you were telling us about how journalism copes with this uh, fragmented uh, kind of political social situation. Uh, is, is, is there hostility of the kind that endangers uh, the work of a journalist? Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I started by saying that uh, Lebanon has always took pride in being the incubator of the only democracy of the Middle East. Now, this, of course, might have changed um, after the 2011 so-called Arab uh, Spring, when uh, since then we've seen many authoritarian rulers in this region uh, overthrown or hugely, uh, you know, their authority has been hugely damaged. But um, uh, since the uh, current president, President Michel Aoun, assumed power in 2016, we've seen many incidents uh, against the freedom of expression. We've seen arrests, we've seen detentions, we've seen um, state-led uh, clampdown on journalism and especially digital media, but also uh, we've seen militias because, you know, countries like Lebanon or Iraq or Syria, there's the state, but there are also militias. There are non-state uh, non uh, armed actors who also do their own clamp clamping down on uh, freedom of expression. And this has been the main theme, actually, of the uh, of what's been happening. Now, Sometimes, as I said earlier, the, the demonstrators would be shutting down streets. So the army would try to forcibly reopen those streets. And um, we would see clashes between the protesters and, and the army or the security forces. Journalists would be there, especially TV journalists. They're going live. They're interviewing people. They're trying to cover what's happening. So we've seen um, reporters being um, almost assaulted physically and pushed away by, by uh, security forces. But we've also seen the same being done by um, militias or supporters of militias, mainly um, Hezbollah and uh, the speakers movement, which is the Amal movement, also aligned with Hezbollah. They have also clamped down on protesters as well as journalists who are covering these protests. Mm -hmm. Now, also it depends, as, as I was saying earlier, each one of those um, media companies uh, that are owned by a certain political party or a certain political leader, they try to cover certain areas, but not cover others. They try to sort mm. of show certain aspects, but not others. Mm. And um, this, uh, this has also had... Asur yeah. seems to have suddenly disappeared from my screen, but we might... Yeah, uh, can you continue, sir? Please, please carry yes. on. Um, I can you hear so me? There, there hasn't been. Yes, uh, I think that uh, the state uh, made a decision uh, early on to not persecute against demonstrators or against journalists who are covering what's we, been we happening in Lebanon. With us. Um, can you hear me? It uh, does look like uh, we've lost our circuit up there. Uh, this time, not of our doing. As I was saying, uh, we lost uh, 
uh, Sir Khatab in, in flow there. He was giving us a greater idea about how journalism operates in a in a fascinatingly uh, in a fascinating arabesque, as it were, of, of Lebanon and Beirut, uh, where you have so many different factions and fractions uh, with their uh, narrow loyalties, uh, with the virtual presence of big countries backing them, like Iran in the case of uh, some of the militias and so on and so forth. So um, we'll move on. We'll try and move on now to our next guest, uh, uh, who is going to be from all the way of the United States and uh, from California. Uh, but we we already have a sense of what the common thread that uh, is indeed the concern and the topic of our discussion today, uh, that of threat to journalism, to journalists, uh, in different ways, in different guises across the world. And we are joined now by Tim Draklis. Um, hello, Tim Draklis. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes. This is... Sorry. I can hear you too, yes. This is Sashi Kumar, and uh, let me introduce you to all those who are following us on this global conversation on media freedom, on the news media freedom. Uh, Tim Draklis is the uh, Tatarian Journalism Chair and Professor at the California State University uh, in Fresno. Uh, he has more than 20 years of teaching experience and over three decades of professional journalism experience. He served as Assistant Managing Director at Newsday on Long Island, part of a team, team at Newsday that won the Pulitzer Prizes for breaking news in 1992 and 97. He's taught college-level courses on reporting, writing, editing, and news design, and is a frequent guest speaker on these topics. He was also a reporter and editor at the Omaha uh, Neb in World, uh, Nebraska and World Herald. So uh, Tim Drackle is very much a, a person uh, uh, after our after our own uh, heart, we, because we are a journalism college, and it's it's wonderful to have a professor of journalism who was a practice a, a practicing journalist of, of of eminence joining us on this very important issue of uh, media freedom and the th threats to the press uh, in the context of uh, saying a halt, crying a halt to uh, uh, immunity for those who are attacking a journalist. Uh, Tim, if I might uh, say, in the United States was always an example of a mature democracy, which set the, uh, uh, shall we say, the the the, the, the uh, great, uh, you know, the, the freedom of the press in our minds. You know, your First Amendment, uh, an enviable piece of legislation, which the founding fathers had the prescience to put into the U.S. Constitution, which says Congress shall make no laws which abridge the freedom of the press. Uh, however, when we look at the United States today. We do see that journalists, uh, journalism seems to be, again, in a state of flux. Um, the, uh, the president of the United States has not uh, made it a secret, I mean, had made, has made no secret of the fact that uh, he's not fond of, of uh, good critical journalism. Uh, and journalists, I think, have responded equally vibrantly. In India, we have a different situation. We have, uh, un unfortunately, I'm afraid, a lot of servile journalism, journalism which is kowtowing to those in power when they are just about, uh, when there's just a sign that they should. But in the U.S., to be fair, I think journalism has been resilient, has uh, defied the the attempts of the of the state, in this case, the president of the United States, to uh, uh, bring it to heel. Uh, do you see this as a as an unprecedented situation in terms of journalism in the United States and what it's facing vis-a-vis -vis the presidency, and how do you see this panning out in the in the immediate future? This is a little bit. Uh, President Trump has certainly taken this to an extreme that that I have not seen in my lifetime. I mean, I have seen uh, Spiro Agnew, the vice president under uh, uh, Richard Nixon, attack the press. I have seen other politicians also attack the press. They tend to attack it, uh, attack it verbally, um, because they think that they're, the press is writing something they don't agree with fundamentally. That it's, 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 a, it's a convenient talking point that politicians use to uh, gather public sympathy for a situation. Uh, Donald Trump has just taken this to, to another level. He's recognized there's a constituency out there that, that wants to believe something like that, and he, so he, he plays on that. The, the, I think, um, I think the, there are issues that, that Trump brings forward that will be hard over a long term to completely solve. Uh, 
the history of the press in the United States is one of, it used to be very partisan uh, uh, back in, in, you mentioned the founding fathers, um, back around that time, right after the Bill of Rights was established, there was a series of controversies where, where newspapers would write very bad, uh, or not very bad, but very opinionated stories about what they thought the president was doing and not doing. And the, and the United States went through a period of time under the presidency of John Adams, where they enacted the Sedition Act, where basically if you printed something that was incorrect, we could you know, suspend your license, put you in jail. And that was done for a period of time. Uh, when Thomas Jefferson was elected, that, that then expired. Um, from that period of time up until the 1920s or 30s, uh, the press was partisan. In other words, you had a, a newspaper that was pro one side or pro another side, and they would continue to to publish stories in that vein. It was only in the in the 20s that that the press changed its mind and started to become more what we would call unbiased, fair journalism. Um, and what we're seeing today, so we've spent the last 70, 80, 90 years being that way. And what we've seen today is, is a slow erosion of that principle where some people now believe what we call in this country advocacy journalism is allowed, is, is acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, if I may, may, may trouble you for a minute, the, that's going on mm -hmm. in this country, well, the, the advocacy journalism that, that we, we've let that, that, thing out of the box, and I'm not sure how well we'll be able to get that back in the box. But what's compounded that is people don't mind the advocacy, and they're looking for publications or pseudo publications that represent their belief system. And what we've seen in this country very recently is the rise of organizations that publish websites in which there is ostensibly some news but it's not really news that's done in a way that's ethical or impartial and pe they are growing in popularity. Um, let me just give you an example. Uh, locally in the state of California, there is a website that's been created in the last year that does say, well, we, we offer news and we cover sports, but what they do is they only cover certain political stories. They mm -hmm. ignore deliberately other stories. And their ethical standards are very weak. Uh, for example, there was a there's a mayoral race in, in a city in California, and the person who wrote the story on this news site actually works for the mayor. Right. Yet he's he's pretending uh, or or to be an impartial or or playing off to the to the world that he is a a an impartial journalist when he's really writing a story that's damaging the the mayor's opponent. Yet at the same time, pretend, you know, saying that this is a story and that it's news and it's just like everybody else. So what we're having, besides the rise of the partisanship and the rise of a bit more of an advocacy journalism situation amongst some outlets, is we're confusing people. Because mm -hmm. what, who's the journalist now? Is it this person who runs this website that is writing a story that's not really ethical and it has half-truths? Or is it, you know, the the Los Angeles Times or the New York Times or the Washington Post? And the average citizen, that gets confusing. Right. Before we continue, there's a question someone's waiting to ask you, and I'll have him or her up now, and then we'll continue with the discussion. Now, the question is from Sandra Whitehead, uh, who says, Hi, Tim, I was out of the U.S. for about past eight years, and when returning, I see that the local news coverage has declined. The old saying, all news is local, doesn't seem to be true. Our national papers like the New York Times and Washington Post provide quality journalism, put local news outlets, but local news outlets don't appear to have the resources they had a decade ago. What is happening? You and your program has done a great job so far of, 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 of talking about that a little bit. Uh, what's happening is simple economics is that the local outlets, the, the national papers of the New York Times and the Washington Post are surviving and doing well because they are gathering subscription revenue. Advertising revenue is, is not what it was. It will not be what it is. And since papers historically have relied upon advertising revenue for to, to, to survive, um, papers are having a harder time publishing. So you have the Times and the Post and they're doing fine because they're they're getting national subscribers. They're not getting local. The local subscribers, the local papers, it's much harder to get local people to subscribe. Um, so 
because they don't have the subscription revenue that the, these these other national outlets have, and because advertising revenue is declining, they're laying off people, and there's fewer reporters today um, in, in established uh, traditional legacy media than there were before because of this financial issue. So fewer stories are getting covered, and because fewer stories are getting covered, subscribe you know readers are saying, well, why are we reading this? Because there's not as much stuff here as there used to be, and so they're going away. Uh, and so it's kind of a catch twenty two vicious circle that, that's occurring. Yeah, it's a catch-22 situation also because the old revenue models, which allowed for the devolved uh, ecology, you know, where you had local newspapers, has collapsed, and the new uh, <laughs> digital media revenue model hasn't appeared on the horizon yet. So it's kind yeah. of a, a kind of catch-22 situation in that sense as well. Uh, very interesting that uh, when we, the the arrive. How, how do you think digital technology has made a big difference in the sense that when Donald Trump tweets in the morning or when Prime Minister Modi in India tweets in the morning, he's tweeting over and above the press. He's speaking to his constituency, to the people that he thinks will, will listen to. And of course, the press, the fourth estate has to take note because when the president tweets, that's that's headline news, right? So he's setting the agenda in any which way he likes, uh, irrespective of the media. And is therefore the media, the fourth estate becoming redundant, uh, both in the eyes of the establishment and perhaps in the eyes of the people as well. Uh, and I can add it to that. Compounding this is also the fact that a good section of the people, the, uh, the people, the civil society or the people at large, um, don't seem to be trusting the media like they did. They think the media are as big a problem uh, or a bigger problem than, than perhaps the politicians they love to vote for or uh, they love to hate, if you like. Yeah, I think the, the 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 partisanship that's occurring and, and this idea of these fake journalists and all that kind of stuff is what's what's fueling a lot of the mistrust of the media. Um, but I also think that you you pose a a, a a conundrum that we haven't quite grappled with in this country very well, effectively, which is yes, Mr. Trump is is. is is tweeting a, a, and we're covering his tweets. And there's a, a lot of backlash and, and within the media right now discussing that very issue is do we, should we write stories about things that he says? Mm -hmm. uh, some outlets are going more in the direction of they're writing policy pieces and daily stories in which his comments serve as a portion of the story. Maybe that's the solution. Uh, some outlets are more going into the zone of, oh, let's just whatever he says, let's report it. Um, mm -hmm. and, I think more conversation needs to occur there. It's probably a mistake to to mm. give him that big of a platform because he's been able to drive the conversation. Um, and that has also, think of it this way, has sapped resources because if we spend uh, a reporter's time every day just writing off of the tweets that he that the president makes, what are we what are we not doing with that reporter's time that could be better used in uncovering a new story and stuff like that? Um, it, it's it's an issue, yeah, yeah. And no one has quite, I think, wrapped their hands around what to do yet. Uh, and yet, the United States, of course, a uh, uh, far cry from the situation we have in, uh, say, other parts of, say, some parts of South Asia, or like we saw from our friend in Uganda. Um, where there are physical threats, you know, there's a physical, there's an existential crisis in more ways than one for the journalist because uh, you can be physically eliminated or you can be set upon by goons or by street gangs uh, or you can be uh, threatened with uh, uh, all kinds of offenses or the income tax or enforcement directorate and revenue officials can be unleashed on you. So there's, there's from a chilling effect to actual threat of life, uh, mm -hmm. that range obviously is still... Uh, at bay in the United States. But do you see journalism the days ahead or months ahead being as resilient and uh, uh, as, as as influential as well? Or do you think that the the, the way the politi politics is evolving and the way the world is evolving, uh, journalism is likely to be on the back foot uh, in, 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 the, in the years ahead? I think the journalism has a fair amount of time to spend on the back foot. I, I, I think because of all this partisanship, it's going to take time to win over people's trust. Um, I do think in, in a weird, again, situation, someone like Donald Trump actually helps the media because it, it, it for the, the, the rational, calm people in society, they, they value the media and they value what the media does as long as they do the media does it correctly. 
And when they have someone like Donald Trump attacking them, attacking the media constantly, I think it makes them defend the media better. We have a, a poll in this country that's been going on since the 1970s about media trust. Uh, and actually, uh, media trust declined, I think, because probably of irresponsible, you know, poor story choices. Oh, since the night, since after Nixon was impeached, the trust went down. However, when Donald Trump became president, the stat has started to go the other way and trust is increasing in this country because I think people recognize that, that what he does say is, uh, Mr. Trump, what he does say is, is not necessarily truthful. Uh, I do think though, um, y yes, I mean, journalists are free to do with it, what they want to do and they do, um, uh, are able to do it well. There are some issues, however. There, there have been situations that occur in this country um, that are a little bit concerning. For example, in San Francisco, which is a very liberal anti-Trump city, uh, the chief of police recently ordered the um, uh, basically search of a freelance journalist's home. The freelance mm -hmm. journalist published a story uh, about a whistleblower uh, that based on information from a whistleblower. Yet. Yet the police chief said, oh, it's OK. They wanted to go into the, apart the reporter's apartment to get see if they can find out the name of the whist whistleblower. And that kind of an action is very rare in this country and mm -hmm. was very unprecedented. Um, at the same time, we also had a situation in Oregon where a district attorney launched a investigation into into a, a the media outlet in eastern Oregon, and, and which he since dropped. But that also, those are very odd situations that we don't normally see. And the other thing, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, um, is we get uh, people yelling at us, fake news and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And that, that's all obviously because of the increased partisanship that, that's occurring. Mm -hmm. it, it's, there are different, there's still things that make me nervous uh, as a journalist that, that we didn't have to worry about so much before. Right. And one last question, uh, Tim, before we let you uh, go. You, we must have dragged you out of bed. In the, what, what time was it there? Is it night, 5 a.m. or some such thing? 6 a.m. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, so I'm fine. Yeah, I'm sorry fine. about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So as a professor and academic who has thought about, reflected on the larger issues of uh, media and the role of the news media and so on, uh, we are, um, you know, um, uh, this is not the last question. There's another question from you for one of our followers. So, but but let me ask this first. Uh, you, you know, the, you you mentioned some of the kind of brinkmanship against the press that is that is worrying. Uh, at the same time, we are also in a stage where the idea of a liberal democracy uh, seems to be uh, uh, you know uh, interrogated. Uh, there are those who who actually flaunt what they call illiberal democracies. Uh, one would have thought that the real meaning of a democracy, to, I mean, democracy gets its meaning when there's a free media accompanying it. If you can say democracy in one breath, you must be able to say a free press in the next. Otherwise, that democracy is largely a sham. But do you see a, di a disconnect happening now that you can still claim to be a democracy because you have elections, you have representative uh, ways of government, you probably have rule of law by and large, but you don't uh, encourage or you uh, you frown upon or you uh, try and suppress a free press. Uh, is that is that a likely uh, uh, you know outcome of of of, of this whole uh, liberal democracy being uh, uh, marginalized in, in this day and age as we speak now? I think it's certainly a cause for concern. I don't see that happening soon. Uh, I think that there's still, the constitution is an incredibly powerful document in this country and it's beloved by the overwhelming majority of the public. Um, I, I, what I see is more of a concern is that I think one of your other guests uh, talked about it in Australia, is a situation where there actually is discussion now in the US Congress, nothing is gonna happen in the short run about maybe Publish, uh, bringing back a law that would criminalize libel, uh, which, you know, if you say right now mm -hmm. in this country, you say something incorrect by accident uh, yeah. or through malicious intent, you you pay a, a financial a fee, right. a fine. Right. Uh, and it doesn't happen that often. Now we're seeing a situation where I haven't seen in my lifetime where politicians are actually discussing, well, maybe we should, maybe we should bring back the Sedition Act, more or less. Right. Uh, it won't happen, uh, but it is, a, it is a definitely a concern, and I agree that, that you know, the 
the First Amendment, the freedom of the press goes hand in hand with, with, with democracy. And I think the major, vast majority of people in this country still understand that and support that. It's a very important point. I think way back in the uh, 17th century when libel was a big issue and as the idea of journalism, the genesis of journalism in England, uh, they said uh, libel was a very big threat to journalism. And uh, yeah. even if it was truth, I mean, as you know, the greater the truth, the greater the libel. <laughs> I thought we had got got beyond that, but it looks like it's coming back. <laughs> it's back on the table. Thank you. And now here's a question from from one of who, yes, this is from Tenzin Zompa Norgan. Can US be looked at as an exemplary country which can deliver justice to the alleged murder of Jamal Khashoggi by Saudi Prince team of Trump's American first and US strategic interests in the Middle East? Or the core issue of press freedom at home will take a back seat. Uh, did you get the burden of the question? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the 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 core issue of press freedom is not going to take a back seat because I don't think the the press and and most of the public are are going to let that that happen. I, I I do think that the question gets into a couple of of issues about aggressiveness of U.S. Uh, reporting of of certain issues in, in U.S potential, uh, you know, complicity in certain international acts, which I don't think the press has been lately as uh, aggressive on pursuing. I think they've been aggressive, but I don't think they, they, they could be more. Uh, and what the attacks on the press have probably certain, because now the press has to kind of defend its own turf, more or less, has, has, has involved a lot of, of uh, journalist time in that regard. I think the implicit in that question was whether the, the political preferences and priorities of the Trump administration have uh, marginalized the, 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 the justice for Jamal Khashoggi, who was, who was killed right. as he was by, 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 by the Saudi, uh, the, the highest levels of the Saudi royal family. Uh, and there, has there been a good enough uh, response to that? Uh, in terms of a, of a political diplomatic response, I, I, I'm not really uh, qualified to, to go there. I think in terms of the journalism, there haven't been, part of the problem of fewer fewer journalists, fewer newspapers is there's fewer people writing these stories, which means, yes, the, in the old days, I think in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, the journalists, there have been many more stories on this issue than there are today. And the fact that it's taken such a backseat and it's even disappeared. Uh, from most most publications is, is line of reporting is, is a tragedy. Thank you very much, Tim uh, Tractors, for that very useful uh, uh, conversation. And uh, I hope we can see you sometime at the Asian College of Journalism here in Chennai to talk to our students. And oh. uh, thank you. And uh, maybe you you should go back to bed and cover the un <laughs> unslipped, unslipped <laughs> period. Uh, thank you very much. That Thank was you. Tim Brackless uh, from uh, California, state uh, from California, speaking to us about uh, the issues, uh, even in the United States, where journalism, one would think, was uh, implicitly a part of the uh, air you breathe, freedom of the press and freedom of expression uh, were, uh, were, were, were natural uh, kind of, uh, you know, entitlements uh, are under uh, threat or under some kind of pressure, certainly. So this is uh, where we are at. And now, before we move on to, to perhaps the last uh, participant of the day from yet another continent, closer home here in India, that, that will be Bangladesh. Uh, I, I, here's flagging a, a poll, a poll question which will come up here. And uh, we ask all of you who are with us now to kindly vote when this pops up on the screen. Uh, this is a poll, uh, which is a, a question. And do please participate and respond to this question when you see this on your screen. I wait like you to see what the question is. Have you got the question? It's done. All right. OK. And so we now move on, I think, to uh, our last uh, guest, uh, who is from uh, Bangladesh. And, he's from, and we'll be moving to Dhaka, uh, Humayun Kabir. Buyan, I hope he's uh, he's there standing by, um, uh, and Humayun Kabir uh, uh, Buyan. There you are. Hello, uh, Mr. Humayun Kabir Buyan. Uh, good evening. Um, good evening, Mr. Kumar, from all the way from Dhaka. Good evening. Yes, it's lovely to have you with us, and uh, uh, you so are our, uh, you, you are our last guest of the day on this very important issue of. Uh, 
uh, press freedom and where we are at. Uh, we have discussed, as you know, with an, with a few others in, in, in South Asia. We have moved across continents and got fascinating responses and views and characterizations of the status of the free press or the status of the media, the ability to uh, practice a free press in, in, in all those contexts. Coming now to Bangladesh, Bangladesh has had some very uh, dramatic, I think, uh, uh, developments over the recent period, uh, where, uh, one, where at least the perception was that uh, there was a strong uh, 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 blowback against the press. Uh, by not necessarily only by the state, but by uh, agents of the state, by like in India, section of street uh, mob, uh, the, uh, you know, the mob acting against the press. How are things now and uh, what is it that will help consolidate uh, freedom of the press and uh, protect journalists from uh, from uh, attacks uh, by, by a a any quarter in society or from the state uh, as we go along? Uh, well, uh, first of all, Mr. Kumar, I would like to thank you for having me. Uh, uh, perhaps among the participants, I have the lowest profile. So with this in mind, let me begin. Uh, I always no, that, that, say... That, that, that's a debatable <laughs> point, but we'll let that pass anyway. Uh, 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 <laughs> so I, 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 you know, apart from my reporting, I teach at a couple of universities. Uh, report, I, I uh, teach advanced reporting. and. Uh, uh, as a guest uh, faculty. And every time I have to tell my uh, student, by the way, two of my students have studied in your very college uh, oh, on scholarship. Yeah. No, all right. So every time I tell them that, look, democracy is the thing, uh, only thing that can ensure democracy. If you look at the countries around, the stronger yeah. the democracy, the much better the freedom of press and expression. So, you know, we are having democracy, you know, quote unquote, we are having democracy and democracy is something uh, which you can turn into a marriage of convenience nowadays. And, uh, <laughs> and as far as our uh, 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 situation as regards to media is concerned, in 2000 and 17, yeah. uh, about 288 journalists were attacked, tortured, and harassed, and three of them uh, were, uh, I mean, were eliminated. And in uh, till September this year, we have only 88 journalists who were harassed. Now, don't get it as an improvement. Now. What happened in Bangladesh is, with the time, we journalists have developed a kind of self-censorship. Uh, in other way, you can say that we have become much smarter than before. Earlier, we didn't know actually what to write, how much to write, and who to write about. Now, with the time, we have become smart to understand that if I work in this newspaper, I can write this this bit. If I work for this newspaper, I can write this bit. So self-censorship is the biggest problem we are facing right now, and that is uh, harming our nation to a significant extent. So there is a, a kind of self-censorship and therefore a not a fulsome freedom of expression as far as the news media is concerned. How organized are media, organi I mean, are the press organizations in Bangladesh? Uh, is, there, is there unionization in terms of journalism so that there is some kind of solidarity, some kind of security in numbers when it comes to threats against journalists, particularly physical threats of the kind that you, that you mentioned? That's a, that's a pity. That's a pity uh, uh, that our journalists are not uh, united. Uh, our journalists are mostly, most of them. There are some exceptions, and I like to hope that uh, one of whom uh, you are talking to, uh, so most of them are divided in political life. Hmm. As simple as that. When, say, there is a union, in favor of the ruling government. So if 
any of their members uh, is affected, well, he or she will get the help he or she needs. But the supporters of other union, no, nothing. Right. They will not get that help. Actually, our journalists, our journalists simply have failed to realize the strength of their unity. They simply failed to understand what difference they could have made for the country if they were united and if they just forgot that we are journalists, not activists. Right. So, th so there is a, a crisis in terms of the uh, profession itself, in terms of what the, the values of the profession should be. Uh, is this really a response to the role of the social media? Because, as you know, social media has uh, taken uh, the 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 the, the uh, people by storm. Uh, I mean, it's made a huge made a huge impact in terms of uh, where journalism, you know, ends and social media begins. It's very difficult. The the, the lines are very diffused, uh, and. Uh, Therefore, and social media is a space for, uh, 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 you know, uh, echo, is a space for echo chambers, for uh, more, for opinions, uh, for loyalties which are based on uh, factors other than uh, liberal democratic sentiments. And is that therefore flowing back into journalism and journalism is destined, shall we say, in some parts of the world to be riven and, uh, you know, faction driven and be pursuing narrow uh, interests, narrow vested interests, or bowing down to narrow vested interests. Is, is this a big concern in Bangladesh, the role of social media and its influence on the mainstream media? Uh, uh, well, uh, personally, I am not concerned about the rise of social media. I'm not concerned at, at all. Because right. interestingly enough, most of the social media users, they do know that there are some contents that appear on social media uh, are not true, are just not true. Fortunately, still our mainstream media have the upper hand, although it has been uh, downgrading uh, with the day. And, and the thing you just said, actually, we had been downgrading ourselves before the social media made its way uh, 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 before the social media uh, has come to the position there today. We right. actually, actually, another thing we tend to forget that the corporatization of journalism has greatly affected, uh, I mean, uh, the very ethics of journalism. Look, I, uh, I mean, I am a student of journalism. I uh, started my career uh, only 30 years back. And during my time, I have, say, I have seen at least some ethics in, uh, among some people, among some editors, among some uh, 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 senior uh, media guys. And, you know, we have a very good press club. Uh, I can well remember in 1990 when I started journalism, I, I hardly so, saw any car on the parking spots of the press club. But now, believe me, when I go to the press club, I cannot even sometimes don't get a space for uh, 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 parking my car. So right. this thing and what learning we got from the university from our journalism teachers, that uh, the very thing that the news will be objective, money will be the medium, but the corporatization of journalism has changed it totally differently. Now, news, now news is the business. Sorry, now money is the uh, objective and news is the medium, which means it's now a business. There is no ethical thing or whatever. Uh, one of those don't exist nowadays in the world of culture. Yes, yes, of course. The market model of the media is a is a reality and uh, and a kind of impinging reality with uh, against which it's difficult to argue. I guess, in particularly in this in this phase of our 
of, of our uh, of our society. Uh, Mr. Human Kabir, just one last question. In in Bangladesh, I'm sure there is there is the English language media, and then there is the Bangla, you know, local language media. Uh, how do you see the relative influence and uh, impact of these two media in terms of uh, uh, the people, and uh, on the one hand, and in terms of the government or the corridors of power on the other? Is it much like India, where the English media tends to have more influence when it comes to the corridors of power, whereas in the language media, Bengali media in your case, uh, is what reaches out to the maximum number of people? Uh, in terms of local media, so uh, uh, I mean Bangla newspapers, undoubtedly they have the most influence on the, uh, uh, on the mass people because of, you know, 98% uh, of our people speak Bangla. But yeah. as, far, as far as English newspapers are concerned, including my one, the Dhaka Tribune, the government is uh, a little bit uh, careful about this little segment of newspapers because it uh, these uh, newspapers have an appeal to the yeah. foreigners. And, uh, and, you know, when it comes to countries like us, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal. Sure. So yeah. foreigners are a factor. So, yes. uh, uh, but uh, uh, we have a couple of English newspapers, not a couple, I mean uh, several, uh, which have an effect even on local issues, but they are more influential in terms of Bangladesh's uh, image abroad and the government's uh, image abroad. Right. By and large. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Humayun Kabir Bhoya, for being with us. And uh, I'm sure uh, uh, we will, as, as we go along, probably find ways of bringing about a greater... Uh, I'm sorry, there's one question from you from one of those who's been following us. This is from Sumon Sarwar. Thank you for being, staying with us. The question is, how, how, does, how do digital security laws affect journalism in Bangladesh? Oh, How do well, security laws affect journalism? Well, well, I, I thank Shomon to remind it. Actually, I forgot to mention it when you asked me a question. By the way, Shomon, Shomon is uh, my student, one of my students. Right. So, uh, uh, yes, uh, it is, uh, I mean, it is a great pain for us, believe me. It is a great uh, pain for us and it is affecting journalism, I mean, to the most significant extent. And this particular act uh, has made so many journalists scared because this particular act is literally a license issued to the government to do whatever they like uh, and to, I don't know, how, how should I describe it? I mean, to do whatever they like to journalists. So this is a this is a great impediment uh, to our journalism, and I I strongly believe that uh, some provisions of this very act must be removed in order for us to operate uh, smooth. I think we recognize that problem even in our context. I think it's common. Or it's quite not, it's, it's become commonplace now to see legislation, draconian legislation, which are like omnibus acts, which can be interpreted any which way by those in power uh, to, to book or to, uh, you know, or, or to threaten uh, anyone who, ha is, who, is, who is practicing journalism, because you don't know when you are falling foul of the law. The, 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 yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, there's more gray area than black and white. And absolutely. The there, are so, there are so many loopholes. Yes. That could be used against anybody. Any so, absolutely, we we recognize, we see that that's very, that's a very familiar and uh, growing. Uh, I mean, a dangerously growing tr trend. Thank you very much, Mr. Humayun Kabir. Uh, it's been you, wonderful talking you, to you. You are certainly most welcome, and uh, I I am sure you are very tired now. Have no, some no, food, been, get some rest. <laughs> it's been invigorating to to speak to such a variety of uh, wonderful uh, practitioners practitioners of the media from so many different places. Thank you. Thank that you. Was, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. That was Mr. Humayun Kabir Bhoya from Bangladesh, from neighboring Bangladesh, telling us uh, what is happening there, kind of reality check on the situation in Bangladesh.
Uh, that brings us to the end of our uh, guests and interactions with our guests. But before we end, uh, it has to be on, I'm afraid, a sobering note, a reality check of uh, the number of journalists who have had to give up their lives merely because they wanted to speak truth to power, speak truth to those who wanted truth suppressed, because they wanted to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And there you have it, the telling figures. Afghanistan, the number of journalists, highest number of journalists killed in 2018. Afghanistan tops this, this, this list of shame, followed by Mexico, followed by Yemen. And you have the individual numbers there, followed by Syria. And there we are, India sixth in the list, and finally, neighboring Pakistan. So that's, that's, that's a very dismal record. Uh, highest number of journalists killed in 2018 features the most populous democracy in the world, India. And that's very significant. The number of journalists killed in 2018. There's another way of another, another graph which comes up. And you see the green area is the Middle East and Arab world, which accounts for about between 21 to 28 percent of journalists killed in 2018. The, the orange, just adjacent to the green, are the Americas, which account for about 29 percent, 28.72 percent to be exact, of the number of journalists killed. Just below that, in red, is Asia, which tops, which, which, which is worse, which is the worst in this chart which accounts for 34 point, 34%, 34.04%, the highest number of journalists killed in 2018 belong to Asia. And next to Asia is Europe, which accounts for, of course, a relatively smaller percentage of 4.2%, that's in yellow. And next to the yellow in blue is Africa with 11.7%. So that's the synoptic overview of mortality of what you call uh, mortality if you practice journalism you know it's, it's a kind of uh, uh, very dangerous profession the way it's emerging particularly in parts of the world particularly in asia and all that journalists do is try to inform the citizenry of things that they have a right to be informed about in this country we have a right to information act but we forget that there is also particularly, uh, you know, devolving upon journalists, a right to inform. Otherwise, journalism has no meaning. And if there is an obstruction to uh, right to meaningful information, then the Right to Information Act itself becomes a mockery. The, the Right to Information Act in itself, as you know, in India is now under, under threat. So uh, journalism, we have seen, is, in, uh, is not in, uh, uh, in, 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 in great shape anywhere in the world. Uh, perhaps in some Scandinavian countries it is, and they are the top five uh, rated uh, in terms of the uh, index to, you know, freedom, freedom index uh, by the Reporters Without Borders. But in the rest of the world, journalism continues to be a very, very difficult proposition. And so we wrap up with uh, this uh, sobering thought that uh, uh, the days ahead are going to be difficult, days of challenge. But then I think it, it can be said uh, truly of journalists, certainly of journalists more than most, that when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Thank you.